those of you who don't know, uh, my uh, on four wheels, two wheels. Uh, we are on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and uh, YouTube. So uh, do a search, um, give us a follow, hit the notification bell uh, on Twitter, and add the hard compound to the hashtags and all that social media stuff. So don't miss out on all the good things that we try and bring you. Um, these are in the form of um, 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 race reviews, uh, race previews, uh, throwbacks, um, breaking news, and uh, anything that we like to put out really about our favourite cars and bikes. Um, as I said, we also do live interviews, as you might have noticed. These are uh, always streamed live on our Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channels and are automatically saved. If you want to watch any of them back, uh, they are saved for you on YouTube and in the video section on our Facebook page. Uh, we've had a number of excellent guests, um, just to give you a quick run through. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, on four wheels and two wheels, uh, we've uh, spoken to legends uh, such as Mr. Mario Andretti and Mr. Jackie X. Uh, real privilege to, uh, to speak with them. Um, and uh, we've spoken to um, um, XF1 drivers, IndyCar drivers, um, sports car uh, racers, the likes of uh, uh, Mr. Derek Warwick. Uh, we've spoken with um, um, David uh, Brabham, Mark Blundell, Alex Caffey, Ari Lyondike, Danny Sullivan, um, uh, the brilliant Mr. Willie T. Ribs, many, many more. Um, we've spoken to a number of uh, drivers from the British Touring Car and the World Touring Car Championships as well, from Andy Prio to Tom Coronel uh, to Jason Plato just last week, Frank Sitton and some of the current drivers as well. But if you're tuning in tonight, you are probably a bikes fan. Um, we've only had a few bikers on so far, um, all, all from the British Superbike Championship. Uh, we've spoken uh, with um, uh, Bjorn Esmond, uh, uh, Christian Iden, Ryan Vickers, Brad Jones and six-time DSB champion Shane Byrne. Um, which is absolutely fantastic. Of course, they're all saved and more for you to watch at your viewing pleasure. But do not go and watch them just yet because we have got another uh, multiple champion joining us tonight from the two-wheel world. Uh, he is a double world superbike champion, former BSB and MotoGP rider. Um, he plays piano rather well and he's a front man, very good front man of a very good band as well. So we've got lots to cover. I'm very excited uh, to speak with him. Um, I've been a big fan of his uh, for for many, many years. I'm not sure if he knew that already, but he does now. So I'm going to bring him in right now. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Mr. James Toseland. Good evening, Rich. How are you, James? You all right? I'm, I'm all right. Very, what a lovely welcome. Thank you very much. No, that's, uh, no, that's all right. I hadn't told you that I was a big fan of yours. I'm a bit embarrassed now, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't many then. There's not many now. <laughs> oh, God. Brand Hatch 2007, I beg to differ. Oh, yeah, there was a few there. There was a few there. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come to that um, shortly. But firstly, thank you very, very much for uh, coming and having a chat with us um, uh, this evening. I think you're the first biker we've had on this year, which is uh, a big slap on the wrist um, for me. But no, thank you very much for coming along. Uh, great, well, great to have you along. I'll, I'll hopefully see if the uh, the ratings die, go lower or higher with two wheels and four. What do you think? Is more is four wheels more popular on these kind of things or two? Do you, do you, do you see? Um, I found that four wheels tends to get a bit more <laughs> traction, if you pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> I just I just heard that. It's terrible. Um, I think because more people can relate to car. You know, we all drive cars and they can all relate to it. But I'm I'm pushing the bike thing. I'm getting more people involved because I love all kinds of racing um it is interesting because it's it's i would say i would say it's pretty 50 50 split down the middle isn't it when you go to like a british superbike meeting yeah i mean the, the attendance is amazing on average to yeah. those events uh compared to i don't know touring cars in the uk um etc cetera, etc cetera. i know the formula one obviously is is a, is a highlight for people and i think silverstone gets close to 150,000 or something over the yeah weekend, but... that's i was i was, was there last year and it was something like that yeah yeah but it's it, it I think, and I don't think there's, I don't think there's much crossover as well. I think you, you know, you are pretty much a, a car fan, or you're pretty much a bike fan. But locally for for this country, I think because of the history that we've had with two wheels and four, and how successful we've been at it with with various different drivers and riders, um, it's it's very popular in in this country. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're very lucky on two wheels and four wheels that we've got two fantastic national championships. I mean, you know, absolutely superb with the British touring yeah. cars and the BSB. But I've always 
I mean, there's some F1 stuff behind me, but Bikes Corner is just over there. <laughs> and there's a lot of bike stuff. I believe you. First love. So, um, yeah, I love me bike racing. First, first live motorsport I went to was bikes at Brands Hatch in 87. Wow. Um, so I've been doing it for a while. But, um, but what yeah. Event was that? What event was that in 87? Oh, an actual event? I, I think it was. It, it was. It was. Um, it, I know the sponsors were Motorcycle News. I remember that. Motorcycle <laughs> News thing. I can. That was the early and days. I for remember. Them. A chap, uh, Terry Reimer, who Terry uh, Reimer, yeah. um, he talks out. I I do hope he's not watching, uh, because he uh, dropped it at the top of Paddock Hill Bend right in front of me, and that's when I first thought. <laughs> he's a to- um, he's a top guy, Terry. I know Terry really quite well. He's he's a lovely, lovely guy, and he um, yeah. I mean, does a lot for the sport. I, Still does some commentating as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I did actually um, speak to him at Brands for the BSB finale, and uh, I mentioned you were coming on for a coming on for a chat and he said uh, you know pass on pass on his ah, best regards Terry's a, Terry's a top boy he's a top boy and he's from down that way as well isn't he down your neck of the woods sir he is yeah he's a yeah. he's a southerner surprised he was uh, brave enough to get on a bike <laughs> if you believe the rumors about southerners but yeah <laughs> <laughs> hey mate you know shake is the most successful ever he's from down there so <laughs> absolutely very far south yeah. um no, smashing. Um, again, you know, well, again, thank you very much for coming on, having a chat. Um, thank I'm you. very excited to speak to you about not only <clears> bikes, but rock music as well, which we'll come to. Just want to say hello to some folks in the comments. Um, Oliver Taylor, uh, Thomas Parker, and a few others. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you've got any questions or any comments, do pop them in the uh, comment section and uh, we'll try and work them in. Um, but uh, yeah, let's let's get cracking, I suppose. Um, what I like to do on all these things is sort of start right at the start. Um you know where did your well from what i can gather bike racing wasn't your first love growing up <laughs> up in yorkshire there was it? it it wasn't uh piano playing was my first love uh primarily through my grandmother my grandmother was a, a beautiful piano player i lost her a couple of years ago uh sadly and that was a, a huge loss to me because what she kind of gave me when i was five or six years old seven years old um was was a lifetime of enjoyment not only for myself, but for other people. And uh, I, I remember my grand playing the piano at Christmas time and it just literally, it, it just developed and, and, and just produced this party every Christmas that everybody would sing to and sing the Christmas carols. She was amazing at playing Christmas carols. And I was just so envious that she had this skill and ability to, I was with this instrument to do that. And, uh, and and I thought I, I would, I think you're either a bit of a show person or not um, naturally. And I was. Uh, so as soon as I realized that she was able to do that, I wanted to create that as well. Mm-hmm. So she taught me from from a young age, five, six. And uh, and it's it's kept with me ever, ever since. And um, I had lessons when I was about eight and nine. And then I, I got to grade six um, before motorcycling took off. But I did I did all the grades and um just love it i think once you get past the uh, the crappy stage on any instrument uh, which is the most difficult thing yeah. because everybody has to get through that and it is a really difficult thing to just really dedicate yourself to the time just to get good enough beyond yeah. that to then get enjoyment from what you do and once you get to that point it will never leave you and luckily luckily i i i, I kind of push through that and it's a, yeah, it's a beautiful thing yeah, no, that's, it's amazing. I mean, I am absolutely not a piano player. I just, no. Um, <laughs> but I do have a guitar sitting just over there. Um, <laughs> luckily for everyone, it's out of tune, so don't worry. But <laughs> but you're right. When you get you start playing music, no, no matter how much you love it, there is that um, phase where you think, I'm never going to get good at this. This is it, because it's all, you know, with guitar, it's all clangy and twangy and rattly, and it just sounds bad. And you think, <laughs> what am I doing? Um <laughs> But I mean, because cor- correct if I'm wrong, there's eight levels, isn't there? Of yes. piano, yeah, and you're at six. Yeah. I mean, blimey, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And um, yeah, you were I, gonna too bad. aiming for music college, weren't you? I was, yeah, I, I, because I, you know, I'm, I'm obviously I'm quite complected naturally, and, and it was it was a big decision to stop taking the exams and try for the uh grade seven and eight. Grade seven and eight, though, they are kind of the A-levels of, of music theory and practic- practice, uh, practical side of it, uh, compared to the one to six is like GCSE level. So to do seven and eight is quite a bit of a step up on passing those two. So you do have to dedicate yourself a lot more. And just as I was getting to grade seven, 
I, I, I was riding around motorcycles doing quite well and, and looking like that could be a profession just at that time. But right. if you get to grade six, though, like I was saying before, you are out of the woods on playing Ferrero Jacques that everybody wants to, to stop at, at the earliest <laughs> point <laughs> or chopsticks. Um, <laughs> and so I'd kind of I'd learned I'd learned to, I'd learned the instrument well enough. I, I understand the instrument well enough where if you give me a piece of music, I can learn it and I can play it. Um, and you know, it would take me a bit longer than a grade eight player for sure. And I would, I would not technically be as good and, and, and it wouldn't be as pleasing to the old ears, but, um, but I can, I can, pl I can do on a piano enough, um, to get, uh, um, the emotion and the, 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 um, escape, um, that you get when you can play an instrument well enough. Um, I, I'm, I'm good enough to do that. And I'm very, you know, that's, that's a real, it's a real privilege and real gift. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've seen footage of you, um, you know, doing some research for this and things like that. I've seen you, you know, doing doing some bits on like the piano on like Question of Sport was one of them. And there was a yeah. you with Mark Marquez, you were at a MotoGP event and loads of other bits as well. And absolutely incredible. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the big memory was the, really the, BBC, the BBC Sports uh, Awards. Um, yeah, of course. My, uh, and my grand was in the audience for that in Liverpool in the, in the, in the stadium when I rode down and, 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 the BBC gave me an opportunity to play with the BBC London Philom Philomonic Orchestra as well, wow. and so that was that was a real highlight of of playing the piano. It was a bit rock and roll as well. It was fun with yeah. the orchestra, and obviously in a state full pack stadium, um, which uh, not many musicians get the the the, the, the pleasure and honour of, of playing in front of so many people with yeah. um, with the adulation as well from 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 doing it. Uh, and yeah, for me, grandchild being in the audience that night was was real, real special. Oh wow! So if you go gone like almost almost full circle from beginning to to that oh, moment yeah. right there was because my grand was hoping that I would be famous and and um, and successful at just that. <laughs> 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 she she didn't want the bike, so yeah, the bike. <laughs> it, it was much safer playing the piano. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, you mentioned. Um, uh, you know uh, the like rock and roll side of it. There, I've got to shoehorn this in. Uh, I did the same thing with um, Alan Hyde, the broadcaster, a couple of weeks ago, and we've spoken um, with Rick Parfit Jr. on here before, uh, which we'll come to towards the end. But um, was there an interest in rock music from a young age, from rock? No, specifically. It, uh, no, basically, the, uh, my mum, who who met uh, my stepdad, that started me with racing. When he came on board into my life, uh, he he played this um in his car with the trials bikes on the back going to ride the bikes for the first time he put this cd on and i was just blown away by this noise coming out of the speakers um in, in his car and it and it was queen and yeah. i'd never heard rock and roll before i'd never heard queen before um i was a classically trained piano player living with grandparents kind of thing and it was quite it was quite conservative you know and yeah. uh, um and it was it was all the old kind of 60s and 70s artists from from the Beatles to um, to Elvis, all that kind of vibe. And then yeah. when I heard this absolute, um, you know, pantomime of a, of, of a noise of Freddie Mercury and the boys doing their thing, yeah. I was just I, I knew then I just instantly knew I think, oh, my God, this is this is a bit of me. This is and yeah, and it just then fit on the way to riding motorcycles, listening to that music. It was like all of a sudden that was it that was that that was me yeah. and obviously then i uh, we didn't we didn't have google or anything back in those days in, in the late 80s but uh, i then found out that freddie mercury played the piano because i got quite a bit of stick playing the piano at school as you can probably imagine like you sure. know, learn, sure. learn an instrument especially the piano it wasn't the guitar or the drums so i had it's to not kind of, kind of like, cool <laughs> yeah i had to battle through that um sure, I'm but sure. then people like freddie mercury uh, that played in a rock band with the piano like it kind of um it it, it made it cool yeah and it, it kind of justified me carrying on and ignoring all of those kind of cliche um problems with at school uh, and and it encouraged me to just uh, carry on with it because it can be cool and, uh, honestly freddie mercury and, and queen and and seeing them live I was like, oh my god, I can play this piano and and, and sound like that. And still well do because, that, yeah. Yeah, because I was listening to rock and roll and I'm thinking, oh, I'm gonna have to learn the guitar to do that. I'm gonna have to to, to play the guitar for that. But there was there was a few bands 
I was I was obviously having you listening to to Elton John and um, Jules Holland and, and all the all the greats, uh, but um, but it was Queen that kind of put those two worlds together. Yeah, and and they and those two worlds go together brilliantly. I mean, yeah. I, I'm the same. I see I'm not too good at playing, but it, to me, it, when I was a kid, I mean, we're very similar in age, only a few months apart, and really nice. But um, it was Queen. My dad was into like Quo and Dire Straits and Mark Knopfler on guitar and. Yeah, I discovered that and motor racing at the same time, and I thought, yeah, as you say, this is a bit of me. So uh, yeah, and it's strange how they go hand in hand. I'm just not as good at it. <laughs> <laughs> you go to a bike meeting now, and over the tunnel, you've got DC, Brian Adams, Bon Jovi. It, it, yeah. It, for some reason, there's certain there's certain events in life that music mm. fits perfectly, and rock and yeah. roll and bikes and motorsport, should I say, is just a perfect marriage. Yeah. Absolutely, and. Why is it that Thunderstruck goes well with every kind of motorsport? No matter what, any time you put it on, Thunderstruck, when the, the start DC. of it. It's AC-DC. Like, it, it's yeah. just, it, it's a Proper remedy job. for everything. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I, I then went Iron Maiden and Metallica and down that route, so, but. Hey, yeah. all of it. I mean, Proper. obviously, well, obviously, you know, I've said a lot of American bands, so let's get Iron Maiden on the list, because, uh, you know, let's get some, some, some British powerhouses as well. Favorite band ever. I'm gonna go and see them again next year. And Quo as well. You just mentioned Quo, and obviously yeah. Rick Poppett Jr. And obviously, oh. unfortunately, we lost his dad a few years ago now. And yeah. uh, and and I, that was one of our first support tours that we did with with my band Toesland, and and it was the Frantic Four tour where all the original lineup got back together again. And wow. that was that was one of the best tours that we did was supporting Quo. It was um, it really kicked our band on. So I've got a lot to thank for um, for, for for the Quo team and that. It's um, it was a big loss for. For Rick Jr. as well, obviously. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we're going to come back to the music a bit later on once you've done the bike stuff. Just before we start and get on the bikes, I think it's probably a good time to mention um, uh, Mr. Rouse, you know, Chrissy Rouse, who we lost um, very, very sadly. I mean, he was actually due to be on here last week. Uh, I'd arranged it with him during the summer, and um, I saw you were on his Chasing the Racing um, chat with him and Dom, and... Um, just an awful, just just an awful accident, isn't it? One of those things. And but what a lovely guy, really lovely yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. And it more than the achievements or anything about being in competitive sport, because in this world that we live in with motorsport, we judge our merits on trophies and and, and accolades. And um, when something like this happens, it's it's all about the makeup of the man. And mm. uh, Chrissy was was a gentleman. And I only had the pleasure of meeting him once when he parked up on my drive about 6 p.m. Uh, with Dom and and sat in his trailer in his little studio that they'd got. They'd come down from Newcastle and, and we chatted for about three hours, similar to this. Yeah. And we did, we, you know, you, you just know when you're in the company of a couple of lads and there's not once where you're looking at your watch or your clock. You're just having a good time, having, chewing yeah. the fat and, and talking about what we love doing. Yeah. And he actually gave me a book as well, bless him. After after what we talked about, it was quite deep in a few places. And and I he, actually watched it a couple of weeks back, and it is it, it goes yeah, it's yeah. really quite something. Yeah, and we've all got a story, and Chris has got his past, his story as well. He had his past, and um, it, it, in and through what we talked about, he gave me this book in his van about uh, um, about mental strength and all the rest of it, and and yeah. just that gesture alone, uh, after only just meeting him once, you could see how kind of considerate he was on actually giving me one of his books that he owned, which which was a special book for him. So to give it to me after only one meeting, um, yeah. it just, it says a lot. And it, it was a, a huge loss to the to the industry. And I am 42 now. And unfortunately with my career, um, there's many. Um, and yeah. that family and friends and close friends and acquaintances uh, along the way that this amazing sport's taken. Uh, but then it's uh, it it doesn't get easier, that's for sure. No, and of course, you know, we had you know we had like Victor Steeman as well, who's lost as well, and yeah, it's just it's been a tough tough few weeks. And as I said, you know, I think I'll just echo what you said about Chrissy, just an absolute gentleman, lovely guy. Um, yeah, yeah, very very sad, but he'll always be remembered, absolutely. And that's yeah, what yeah. that's what his podcast will do as well. It will keep him. Yeah, and I, and I think that's why it hit it hit a lot of people because that podcast and the, and it was a mobile podcast. Their studio was literally a trailer on the back of their van. Yeah. So that enabled them to meet a lot of people because they went to them. 
So anytime yeah. they said, can we have a chat? Everybody just went, we'll just park up on your drive. It'll take you two hours. Of course, everybody just went, yeah, of course, lads, no problem. Because it didn't put anybody out. You know, they literally just park up on your drive and have a chat. So it was amazing. It was easy. So because of that, yeah, they 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 interviewed a lot of lot of people, and they've got such they got a lot a lot of good amazing content because of that. And like you say, it'll, it will live forever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, lovely guy. Um, right. <clears throat> so I mean, yes. Um, on back onto you and your your beginnings. I mean, you you touched on it. Um, if your step stepfather wasn't it? You said it was. Um, um he yeah. brought bikes along and because you you began going off-road biking that that was how you started wasn't it i, mm. I remember reading some of you were flying over slag heaps and stuff back in <laughs> <laughs> back, back in your hometown yeah I, I trials riding was the first thing i had a second hand trip ty80 and i loved it you know going um up on the yorkshire dales here and and doing the sections and learning out the skill of the balance and the clutch control and 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 to to, to learn motorcycle riding with trials first it, it was just such good preparation for all of the disciplines because you've got to have ultimate control really with trials riding of a motorcycle underneath you to stop dead and keep balance and not put your foot down and and all of the kind of physics to it to to understanding what a motorcycle does in different places. Trials was perfect. And I loved it for that. And I loved the kind of how social trials riding was. Everybody kind of met at the beginning of the section, you walk together and you give each other tips. And it was it 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 was more just competing against yourself rather than other people, which then right. kind of took the pressure off that intense kind of atmosphere. You've got to beat your teammate or you've got to beat somebody yeah. to be the best. And it's trials riding didn't have that. Yeah, it was an individual thing. Even though you wanted to win at the end of it, you didn't think, you didn't think actually who you were competing against until the end of the trial when you just figured out who'd put the feet down less. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And I loved it for that. Did four years of that, and then <clears> went on to motocross because I saw motocross with um, on on TV once, and I just fastened. And I was just getting to a teenage age where I wanted to go fast. Now, not yeah. just you know, not just have a bike. So. Uh, I wanted it to be a bit more cool, I suppose. And yeah. but I was really short as a 12 year old, so I couldn't hardly touch my feet down. Oh, right. And we noticed, we noticed the road riders, um, road racing, you, you didn't need the height to, to do that discipline. So that's, that's why I only had a couple of years at motocross before I went to road racing when I was kind of 15. So, okay. yeah. Just on that subject, something just popped into my mind from sort of my childhood. Um, do you remember the TV program? Was it Kickstart? Kickstart, yeah, of course. It was like, awesome. like Dougie Lampkin, absolute yeah. legend. It's, and oh, he's still yeah. going. Um, yeah. I remember to, he's the one name that stuck out. I used to love that show. God, it was just it was fantastic. Ever. Yeah, and it, and, it, and it kind of it made trials riding cool as well because it was yeah. on television. Because obviously, you know, trials riding then compared to motocross. You know, motocrossers look like i suppose it's like if you're a skier or a snowboarder <laughs> yeah, yeah you know yeah. this kind of skiers you know they they're not as cool as the snowboarders and i think the trials riders are a little bit of that compared to the motocross riders so but yeah kickstart yeah. was ace that was great i just remember watching it and thinking it's brilliant and i don't know why buggy lamp can always stuck in my head but he's still often doing things that he's doing big things and he probably stuck in your head because he, he never lost on it <laughs> he, he, he was always the winner yeah he was always yeah. there <laughs> o only man to do to pull a wheelie for the entire Isle of Man course, isn't he? Did you see that, by the way? That's oh, ridiculous. ridiculous. Oh, to, to, I mean, of, of all the things to talk about on the Isle of Man, uh, physically really? and mentally, to have a bike on its back wheel for thirty-seven and is it thirty-seven three quarters or thirty-seven and a quarter? Anyway, over thirty-seven miles. Like that, uh, it's it's not so much pulling a wheelie; it's pulling a wheelie and and mentally. Um, just being in that zone of concentration mm. to to just keep doing it for that amount of time just I mean, but if you i mean I've, I've i've had the pleasure of meeting dougie a few times and it doesn't surprise me because to be what what is he like a 25 time world champion or something yeah. to, to be that many times world champion you, your your focus and your commitment to stuff is <laughs> i think is unquestionable yeah, so. yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah what a great guy what what a great show loved it um so you went on to motocross and did that for um you know did that for a few years and had a bit of success with it i was yeah i was i was uh, i was best newcomer in uh, 1993 i think it was in the ymsa 
I was, I don't know to say YMCA, but that's in a completely different thing, isn't it? <laughs> the, <laughs> that's a completely different thing. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, the YMCA club. So, yeah, I think I finished sixth in the championship my first year, but I always, I got injured quite a bit. I, I, my, as Casey Stoner said, my ambitions outweighed my talents. And on a motocross track, it can get quite dangerous. <laughs> I'll bet, I'll bet. <laughs> no, cool. Um, so, in, so you did that, you got your best new cover. When did the, when did the, when did the switch to uh, to going racing on tarmac happen in in your mind and then in and then in in practice? I, I saw Kevin Swantz win the World Five Hundred Championship in nineteen ninety three on the on the Pepsi Suzuki, and he pulled a wheelie with his legs sprayed out and and standing up on the on, on stand up wheelies and 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 Kevin Swantz was like, oh my god, what what's this discipline now? Because because I was new to motorcycle racing completely, like I was just. I was just kind of discovering different disciplines, what you could do on two wheels from trials riding. I love first, and then went on motocross and which was so different. And then I saw them on, on the tarmac getting the knees down. And I thought, wow, that, that looks, that looks amazing. And obviously the first time I rode a road bike, which was a, a Kajiva 80. And I went round a go-kart track at three sisters in Wigan. And I, I didn't get my knee down first time. That's for sure. But I just remember going round and, and, and again, like listening to queen in the car, I found my thing like the, the petrol, the petrol tank wasn't big enough because <clears throat> I just, I, I just didn't want to come in, you know, right. <clears throat> all day. Like even going home, I just didn't want to go home. I just wanted to fill it up, fill it up Kevin, go again. Like, and go again. Just, uh, yeah. Wow. And, and the difference of emotions from trials riding to motocross to road racing, that really surprised me on how much I absolutely adored that discipline compared to the other two as well. Oh, right. So it really clarified that in your mind as well. Yeah. That was massively more enjoyable for me than the, the other two were like hobbies. But as soon as I jumped on that Kajiva 18, I went around a go-kart track with like trying to get my knee down. I thought, oh my God, this is, this is, this is, this is all I ever want to do. I, I can do I, this. I, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I just, like, with the piano and with, with road racing, like so, so, so lucky that, I met people that actually taught me two things that I just could not not do with my life, which gave my life just so much enjoyment. And that that's that's really really lucky to just have one thing that to get introduced to yeah. by by parents or grandparents is is something, but to get introduced to two things that um, made such an impact was was really special. Yeah, it could be focal points of your life as well, just to channel something towards it, which is you know, I think yeah. it's hugely important. You've got to have something to other kiss. Okay, Otherwise, your brain just goes over and, it, and you just go nuts. You need to channel it and to have two things, as you say. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I did feel a little bit guilty because as soon as I, I, rode road, I jumped on road racing bike, I knew then that the piano lessons would, would taper and not, right. be, not be priority. And right. I felt a lot of responsibility to get to grade eight with how much my grandma put into me to, to teach me piano. And, and I wanted to complete that for her mainly before committing fully to the bikes yeah. i wasn't able to do that but but luckily luckily i always kept my music that's why i always kept my music up because of of that um that kind of pact i had uh with my grand to uh sure. I, I would never have ever just just even though i loved road racing and then piano was always going to be a hobby from that point um I, I i always i always kept it up just just because of that yeah, you, it was never going to just be forgotten about. Yeah, no, it was no, always there. I guess you yeah. love it too much as well. Um, yeah. I mean, just maybe, I mean, we. I was going to ask a question about: Did you have any heroes when you started riding? I mean, I think you may have just answered it. I mean, I've got, I've got in the notes here. Let's see if we have the same heroes because we're similar <laughs> ages. So, yeah, and you nailed it. Kevin Schwantz was the one for me. As soon as I saw him on the bike, hanging off the bike, arms and legs up, and just thinking, "Is this guy? This is." wow what a guy just that maverick thing about him um it was it him and spectacular um, it was him and freddie spencer and spencer then, yeah and then wayne rainey and rainey, all those guys doing just like <laughs> wow. oh, it, it was an incredible era with with like a golden era of, of motorcycle racing and, and mm. talent <clears throat> Yeah, and like yeah, he what he was once once was uh, was 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 one of the first people I watched on road racing, just before the doing kind of uh, dominance, and um, so from the mid nineties, 
and it, imagine imagine i was in 1998 i was 17 years old i just got a first ride with castrol honda in the world super sport championship and i mm -hmm. i went to laguna seca for the first time and you know swans was a hero of of mine and I, I sneaked into a bar in Laguna Seca at 17, obviously being having to be 21 over there. Mm -hmm. And I was at the bar and I, and I kind of got keep my head down amongst the engineers and stuff. And someone tapped me on the shoulder. I thought, Oh Christ, I've been spotted. I'm going to get kicked out. I turned around. It was Kevin Swans and he made a beeline to come up and he complimented me on how I went through the corkscrew my very first time there. And he was watching at the corkscrew and he says, I just want to say, him, really impressive for the first time there. Good luck for the rest. And can you imagine? Wow. Can you imagine? So you draw must that, have hit the floor. Oh, I mean, from that point on, I mean, Kevin was a hero of mine before that. And then ever since, like, you know, Kevin Swans, if anybody's had the pleasure of meeting Kevin Swans, there is not an there is not a, a customer that's not completely satisfied from 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 you know meeting him. It's a, he's an absolute gentleman and a superstar. Wow, what yeah. a moment! That yeah. is amazing. Wow, <laughs> I'd be like that now. And I'm yeah. I still am. Yeah, if Kevin still comes up to me now, I'm still the same. <laughs> You're like, okay, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, there's, there's there's only a few, uh, you know, as a professional rider, there's only a few riders that walk walk up and walk past and go, you know, I mean, uh, so Agostini on the screen at to Valencia for the last MotoGP, and you know, there's uh, there's there's certain riders, obviously Valentino, there's certain yeah. riders that have certain stature in this in, in this industry that are you know proper royalty. Yeah, and you've just named my three favourites ever. So <laughs> <laughs> present present completely accepted of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> save that <laughs> um <laughs> but i mean so yeah you've decided to have a go on you know doing the the track racing how did the progression come through you know you mentioned you got your you know your ride with the cash 100 super sport how did you get from thumping around a go-kart track going yes this is me to was... to there i mean you worked your way through of course yeah there was a new championship the year before in 96 uh, sorry, 94, called the Junior Road Racing Championship. And I joined in the second year of that championship in 1995. So 95 was my first year of road racing. I was against uh, the uh, the dizzy heights of uh, Steve Brogan and James Ellison. And yeah, uh, we were all rattling around. I was 14. And I think, obviously, I think James is a bit older than me by a couple of months, but all the same age. We're all about 14. Uh, and I, and I, I ended up winning that championship in my first year, which was a bit of something to achieve, which kind of then I got into a team uh, called Mick Walker team that was in the super teens. Right. Uh, so 95 juniors and then super teens in 96, but I was on a Kajiva 125 that year and the, the Aprilia RS came out. And I remember getting lapped at Brands Act by the, the late great Carl Harris. And that was a, that was a, um, a bit of a low point of my career, as you can imagine. <laughs> I, can lie there, around, yeah. Yeah, I was lapped. I was literally lapped around Brands Act on a Kajiva one two five in super teams by Carl Harris. And, um, <coughs> wow. Uh, and then, and then in 1996, uh, I, I had some uh, some family problems, and I wasn't able to finish the year be because of those. Uh, and then, luckily for me, in the village, there was a guy who owned a team and ran a team called Mick Walk uh, Mick Corrigan, and he had his own team in Supersport. And there was this new championship called the CB 500s. Hmm. And he heard that I couldn't go racing on my own at that point. And he said, well, I've got a team. I'll take you in my team. You ride the CB 500 and I'll ride the 600. And, and he saved, he saved my, my career because without oh. meeting Mick Corrigan on the pit top here in Kivan Park, where I'm from, that's why I used to practice on the slag heaps, like you said. Right. I was over there rising round one afternoon and he was on his motocross bike and I went chasing after him and round the field and he was the British super sport runner up that year in right. 96. So he was handy. Yeah. And I was, yeah. I was right. I remember rising around this field going, there's usually not too many people that are as quick as me on here, but he, he's, he's rapid. Yeah. And, he's rapid. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I pulled up and he pulled up at the side. He went, Hey, what's your name what, what, what do you do and obviously obviously we were going fast enough to realize that we did it like a decent level yeah. um and the 
he then he heard the story about what had gone on and uh, he, he he rang up and and then had me in his team on the CB500, which was without Mick Corrigan, without Bob Mick Corrigan, his brother and, and Dane and that team from 1997, uh, my my uh, my motorcycle career would have 100% finished. Wow. And so that, I mean, <clears throat> pretty much everyone I've spoken to on here, whether it be young up and coming racers or people like Mario Andretti and guys like that, they've always got a, and then I met someone <laughs> moment. And that was obviously yours. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously my mom's <clears throat> boyfriend that she met, Ken, he was the one that introduced me to racing. He wrote, he had a, a bike on the road. He didn't race himself, but he started mm. me in, in it and introduced me to trials riding and, and, and then into road racing. And he was, he was there in 96 when we started super teens. Uh, but, um, um, so yeah, it, it was, it was Ken initially that, um, like yeah. just introduced it to my life. Yeah. But then, but then I was lucky to get introduced to, to, uh, amazing teams and engineers that, that helped me develop my skills and, uh, enabled me to ride amazing bikes to to win things on rather yeah. than getting lapped around brands out on a could you want to buy bike. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean just I mean again correct if I'm wrong from the research and bits that I've done here. Um <clears throat> was this the time where was it that occasion where you said you need to find 15 grand or something or you need to find mm -hmm. a sum of money and you were pestering your mum to <laughs> to let you have it or was it that kind of was no, Mick, 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 Mick Cogan rang me and said, look, I, I can take you racing. If you want to still race, I can take, I, I'll take you racing. I've got this CB500. It's a new championship in the UK, but I'll need 15 grand for you to do it, but I'll I take you. So I, I put the phone down, went into the kitchen and we weren't a rich family by, by any means at all. Uh, and <clears> I said, mom, I said, um, have you got 15 grand? Because if you've got 15 grand, I can carry on racing. So uh, we, I remember sitting down with her and she didn't really want me to do it because we just sadly lost his cousin, my cousin, Stephen, which was Ken's nephew um, at Cadwell Park uh, only um, a year or so before that. And right. so that was still quite raw. And then um, obviously £15,000 was a lot of money. Um, mm. She sat down and she could see how much it meant to me, bless her. And I said, look, just give me one if there is possibility just give me one chance and i'll promise that um it'll go all right i mean i had no idea i mean the oh, year yeah. i mean six months before i was getting lapped around brands out by Kalaus, you know so um but i don't know I, you know i loved it obviously i didn't want to give it up and fortunately <clears throat> for me even with that bereavement in the family with losing a family member my mom kept my dreams alive bless her so i'll be wow. forever thankful for that wow that's amazing yeah. And that, as you say, it's a big investment, isn't it? Um, yeah, I bought I her a caravan when I started doing well. That was that was the. She didn't want my money back, but she wanted a caravan, so I bought her a caravan. <laughs> <laughs> Has she still got it? No, no, she's upgraded that one now. Oh, even better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, she still she still got a caravan. Bless her. Even better, brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, <clears throat> so you've you know, so you've gone on, you've gone racing, and. Um, Again, yeah, you mentioned like the Honda, you know, CB500 Cup. That's the Thunder Sport now, isn't it? That's all morphed into the Thunder Sport. I think Cup. it is, yeah. I think yeah. they're racing 600 in the same category, right? Something like that. I think yeah. so, yeah. And they let was it, was it Suzuki and Kawasaki bikes in or something because it was Honda yeah. and, or whatever it was, whatever, however yeah. it came about. Yeah. Um, was it 97? You pretty much smashed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Blitzed it. I, I, I remember... <clears throat> I remember we, me and Bob and Dane went down in the van without Mick because Mick injured his collarbone just in the winter training and wasn't right. able to do the first round at Brands on the 600 because he was going to go for the championship that year after finishing second in 96. So he didn't, he didn't come down. And I was in the newcomers category. There was a newcomers category and an expert category when it first started. And I was only 16 and I wasn't old enough to join the um, the experts because that was adults and it had to be 18. So I had to go in newcomers. And I did the Friday practice and I was 2.2 seconds faster than second. Um, bear, in mind, uh, bear in mind, bear in mind, I was lapped there a year, well, six months before. Um, I jumped on this CB500 and oh, talk about fun. It was like the best fun ever. Uh, and obviously CB500 didn't have that much power. And, 
obviously I, I was I was like a little skinny little rat at 16 years old so and and the newcomers in the CB500 they've got a bit of cake on them shall we say so I've got a bit of power to weight ratio advantage on, on those <laughs> and um so so Friday I remember Friday afternoon Bob Mick's brother rang Mick and went I think you're gonna have to come down to Brands Mick is is blitzing it like I think I think Mick was getting the money and that was helping with his racing as well, which um, which was not a problem at all because 15, 000, it doesn't go a long way, 15 grand in, in a year's racing, even back then. Cool. So um, uh, so I thought it was just funding him, but I, I, I don't think he, I don't think he thought the, the success of what I was going to do. I mean, nobody did, nobody could. I mean, yeah. like I say, six months getting lapped and then all of a sudden, you know, CB 500. So, wow. so he, he jumped, he jumped in the car and came down. And then the afternoon session, I was still two seconds faster than the second place. So Mick went to the organizers. It wasn't Stuart Higgs now. I can't remember who it was, but he says, we've got to get him in the experts. This is, this, this is, this is too much stuff. So. Right. Um, and the nice thing was in 1997, I was the rider that they changed the age rule from being 18 to ride a CB 500 and a 600. To it being sixteen, um, right. they changed the rules that so day. They the age. That day at Brands, they changed the rules for me um, from wow. eighteen to sixteen because they realised that sixteen year olds could do it, and that was that was a real thing. I was really proud of that. And, oh, yeah, but, so yeah. they they moved me up to the national the expert class the day after, qualified on pole and won. <laughs> so, and I won. I won. I think I won nine out of the ten rounds, and I got knocked off at the last race. That's the only one I didn't win. Um, Wow. And yeah, I don't know why. Well, I mean, it just you clicked, think, did it? It just you just felt comfortable. Yeah, I'd, 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 um, a few <clears> things sparked a fire in me. I lost my stepdad, who started me in racing that year before, and and yeah. and that was um, that was that was really really that was really damaging, and that mm. was really confusing, and and it you know for for a young lad with a lot of frustration and an anger inside them with only a little CB 500 underneath them. Um, you can do good things. <laughs> and, and luckily I, I just channeled all of that into my racing and my racing then became my therapy from, from it all. Right. And it, it, it was for the rest of my career, but it, um, in 1997 was the first time, um, I realized the mental approach to motorcycle racing on how, how you tick and who you are right can can right. can breed success and yeah. uh and obviously having ascended. and obviously having the event that had happened obviously not going to go into it i mean that's quite a you know that's a huge thing to have happen and yeah it as you say it sort of shows the power of the mind when you can channel whatever you're feeling into something and what you can achieve just yeah it is it is i mean yeah i mean we, we we all have challenges in life and and um, I was I was really really lucky to have something that I I could I could take it out on and um, yeah. and I, and channel it into to to being okay and not you know when when serious things happen in your lives with bereavement or whatever um, if you haven't got something to channel into your life can can spiral uh, downwards pretty quickly because Absolutely. we try and block it out I, I think we all try and block things out yeah. And riding motorbikes around at 200 miles an hour was the best mind blocker ever. Yeah, and, and, it certainly and gets I, your attention, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was certainly better than alcohol or drugs, which is sometimes yeah. the 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 only kind of medicine for for these things with some people. It's so uh, it was yeah, I was I was lucky in that sense to have, yeah. have that to do it. Yeah, must have the outlet. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so you've got so the success there. You stepped up to the was it Super Sport thereafter um with, the same year yeah. yeah with honda and uh around the national <clears throat> around the national circuits and obviously that you know you've won races at national level and then um the castrol chaps uh came on board didn't they they came you know yep. that 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 came along and you headed up to the european well well to the world so, 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 yeah. sky, uh, stage sorry yeah, it was a world championship first in 97 it was classed as and then mm. i joined in 1998 and uh again it was a bit of a, a, a tough um um start to to the to my international campaign i did the the first race at donington 
which was in March, and I, I crashed at McLean's on lap two. So <laughs> that was uh, that was a, quite a bit of a baptism of fire. Um, I think I qualified on the second row though, so like I think I was fifth or sixth or something in my very first super sport race, so not too bad. But the Honda on Michelin's wasn't really that competitive at that particular time, unfortunately. But you know, got the best out of it, and then went to Monza. And I broke both my ankles in the second round uh, quite badly. And I, I had to have both ankles screwed Ooh. at the same time. And that was on the Friday. So I was driving home on the Friday with two broken ankles. And, and then on the Saturday, I, I, I lost my teammate who was tragically killed, um, Mikel Paquet, um, as well, uh, in the same weekend. So the whole team was wiped out in two days in their very first year in World Supersport with Castro Honda. So Neil Tux with the team manager at that point and all my engineers and it was um, a real tough start to, to that campaign for sure. Wow. That must have been a heck of, you know, another thing to deal with. You know, you obviously had a bit to deal with before. That was another thing to deal with the loss of your teammate and injury and everything. And um, I mean, when you were in the team, though, with the cash ball backing and things like that, did you feel, sort of, was, was there like an extra pressure on you? on you or did you feel any extra pressure because you think they've put faith in me and they've backed me or anything um, like that i think once you get to international level there's instant pressure because yeah. um, the level of cost that it, it requires to actually compete and go racing at that level requires performance and uh, and, and achievements to sustain it to attract the level of sponsorship that it takes to 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 even go racing that's the that's the kind of merry-go-round that everybody's on at the elite level of any sport. And Castro and Honda had such heritage from, you know, the old days of Aaron Slight and, uh, and John Kaczynski, who won in, in 97, um, to Carl Fogarty in 96. Uh, uh, and, and obviously then Colin Edwards with the amazing couple of years he had in from 2000 to the epic battle with Bayless in 2002. So, um, it had such history and the Castrol Honda sponsorship like Repsol Honda in MotoGP. Yeah. When you put a Castrol Honda shirt on, you knew that you'd, uh, you, you'd got, you're in a very, very good team and they expected results. Uh, so yeah. it was, yeah. But, but to be honest, if, if you're that competitive and you want to succeed at the, at the top, then no team or sponsor or, or any external pressures should exceed your own um, expectations yeah. of yourself. And as long as you keep that balance, then usually you're pretty good. Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, you can sort of do it more for yourself rather than for anyone else, I suppose. <clears throat> or yeah, or certainly in equal measure. <clears throat> yeah, you you you've you've never. It, the one trick is is to never to never be satisfied of of where you're at as an individual as a sportsman. Yeah. You, you've just got to wake up every morning and being better that day than yesterday, yeah. and that is the relentless treadmill that you if you want to get on it get on it but but there ain't no slowing down once you've you've, you've chosen that path because at elite level there'll always be someone just turning that speed up on the treadmill a bit faster than you are and so it's 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 it is tough and that's why i say it's tough at the top because the amount you have to do right and the amount of dedication and and, and focus that you need to stay um at that level is relentless and that's why it's tough to stay there because um, <clears throat> it's not easy to live like that and to be that selfish and that cut off and that mm -hmm. um, one track minded about something. But to be that good at something, to be the world's best at something, you have to. There's no, there's no, there's no compromise with that. So it's, um, it, it is, it is, it's a, it's a real balance for your life. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um, obviously, I've never been anywhere near that kind of situation. I can only imagine how tough that must be just to keep up with everything and um but you had those um you had those two years um was it 98 99 um in super sport and um <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> then you made the switch to sort of come back sort of home as it were to the you know to the bsb uh with uh, uh paul bird obviously he's now still going he's done rather well um He's just changed his team for this year as well. You know, changed his riders with you know, Glenn and Tommy and all that. Um, how did that? How did that come about? That sort of switch uh, back to the BSB. Um, I, I was quite unsuccessful at World Supersport mm. for two reasons, or oh, a few reasons. Inexperience. I didn't know the tracks, obviously. 
Right. The Honda and the Michelins weren't that competitive at all. Um, it was all about Suzuki's and Yamaha's uh, at that point, really. Sure. And to be honest, it, it kind of stayed the same until Tenkate came along with the Honda, and then they got some success with it, didn't they, um, in the late 90s and early 2000s. But um, So the combination of being on an uncompetitive bike at that point with not knowing the tracks against the World Boys, um, I got a bit of a spanking, to be honest. Um, so... I remember being at the NEC show in uh, around this time, isn't it? Around November. Mm. And I went on the Honda stand and Harvey Beltran, uh, who is now the, the team manager for, for the Honda team in the UK for British Superbike, said, oh, what are you doing next season? Um, and I said, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I haven't got a call to do World Supersport again. And uh, so I'm not quite sure. And literally that was it. Because I, I got no manager at that point no real family um, helping us out on, on, on deals at all. And uh, I just assumed that something would happen, but I don't, I was, I was really naive because I got no, no inkling of, of looking around for another ride. If I'd lost one, I just didn't know that that would even exist. So he said, Oh, let me, let me ring Tuxworth. So he rang Tuxworth and he, he literally about 10, five minute phone call. He, he come back and went, yeah, you haven't got that ride next year. I went, all right. And I got my Castrol Honda shirt on at the NEC. <laughs> so they told him that they hadn't. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's how I lost my job with Castrol. Uh, Terrific. All oh, right. Um, so he said, "But yeah, but you can. Um, we, we've got a position for you in British Supersport." I was uh, I was eighteen at this point, still, or just nineteen. I've just turned nineteen. So um, I said, "Well, I've already done Supersport, and I kind of I kind of won those races when I was sixteen, so." Is there a superbike ride, British superbike ride, possible? And he went, oh, actually, Bird is on about running a superbike next year for the first time because he, he was in one two fives and two fifties at that time with John McGuinness. Um, so, and I think he'd won the championship with McGuinness in two fifties the year before, which was ninety nine. So uh, he gave, he gave Birdie a call, and literally five minutes after that, he went, yeah, Birdie, I'll have you on this SP one. There's a new SP one coming out. And um, we're not going to get the bike until February, though. So you'll do all the testing on his on his 500 twin that he'd got, like a Grand Prix twin bike. You do your testing on that at Mallory Park, which we did. And we got the, with the SP1, honestly, about three weeks before the season season started. And um, and and that's how I started my British Superbike campaign. Wow! Literally like literally like that. Uh, and I, I I did half a year. I had an incredible ride at Alton Park. And I beat Mal McKenzie on the INS Ducati and I finished fifth or six. And that was one of my real highlights of my whole career. Because right. Mal McKenzie, again, yes. when I was growing up in the mid-90s on the Cadbury's boost bike, was a real hero of he mine. Won with three titles in a row, didn't three he? Three titles, yeah, yeah. Yeah, three titles. Obviously, Whittam and McKenzie was legendary, wasn't it, at that time? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And so to be riding around the track with him as a 19-year-old uh, was, was really something. And then I went to Cadwell and a, a test and I broke my femur really badly. I had my leg underneath my head when I landed. It, oh. uh, it was, it was quite a horrific injury and I was helicoptered off to, to Lincoln oh. hospital and, and um, was, it, so I did, was it, what you just came off and I came off at, um, I came off at Charlie's turn two and yeah. I landed on the curb and the curb was quite serrated uh, at Cadwell and it just snapped my femur in about six places. Oh, uh, it's like a spiral fracture. Mm. And, uh, so when I stopped rolling, my, my leg was um, under my body uh, in, and, and my other leg was the other way. You know, it was really horrible. So, oh, um, God. Yeah, um, I'm sure. Um, oh. and, and that was that was like August of 2000. So I missed the second half of the season. Right. But because of that race at Alton Park with Nan McKenzie and my SP1 was pretty steady. It, it was it was really low on horsepower compared to the, uh, the Ducatis and stuff because Neil Hodgson, it was the race where Neil Hodgson came from the back. From he, he got a penalty and he was on the back row. Yeah, and he came and won. He won the race. Incredible race. Yeah. So um. Wow. Uh, so yeah. Wow. So uh, and be, but because of that result, I I I picked up the the, the years and, and and got noticed by um, one Roger Burnett, Neil's manager, Neil Hodgson's manager, and obviously more important Colin Wright and Daryl Healy of the GSE team that when they won the 2000 championship with Chris Walker against Chris Walker at the last race at Donington, when Chris, no, 
uh, broke down, bless him, in that mm. final race. Um, they were going to World Superbike in 2001, mm -hmm. and they were taking Neil Hodgson, and they needed a teammate. And and luckily for me, Roger Bennett uh, talked to Colin. I had a meeting with Colin, and did the two-year deal with them on crutches. And that was the luckiest. Other than making Mick Corrigan on the pit top to keep my career going, that yeah. was that Alton Park ride battling with Nan McKenzie on on, a, on an SP1. Um, that was um, that that was that was pivotal in 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 obviously then the the the, title, the world titles. For sure. It was like the real kind of shop window kind of moment. I suppose it was that where you know people could see what you know people could see what you could do. Um, yeah, and then luckily, wasn't necessarily the best one. Well, luckily as well, <clears throat> even though I was uncompetitive at World Supersport level, they knew I knew the tracks. So of course. even yeah. even though I, I'd not been that great at that level, um, I all of a sudden I was riding very well on a superbike at nineteen, which was unusual. Yeah, um, there was like uh, myself doing well at national level in the top five, which is not easy on an uncompetitive bike. Top five of BSB. Um, there was there was Nicky Hayden like in the states on the RC45 and the SP1 as well. Um, he was doing a similar thing at a similar age, like he was 18 and then, and I was kind of 19 and and like it was unusual for teenagers to all of a sudden ride superbikes at national level. It was like the new thing. It was like when it was like when Mark Marquez proved that at uh, at 19, 20 years old you could ride MotoGP bikes. Yeah, that, it was that unheard was of, was it? Yeah, that was unreal. So, um, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not classing myself as the same kind of thing, but it, it was it was unusual that at that age that the um, a teenager was riding at superbike level and doing okay, and um, and then with the track knowledge I had, that then gave me the in on getting the world superbike ride with with Hodgson. Right. So it kind of even though it was a difficult path, it actually when you look back, it it, it all fell into place at, at, in the end really. It kind of paid off, you know, from having that experience of racing in Europe. Um, just very quickly that. Was it, it was a Vimto bike, wasn't it? I mean, I always remember the Vimto bike. It was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. But a big, a big honour that year was um, with oh. Joey Dunlop riding in my bike at the Northwest Two Hundred and, and the yeah. TT, and that was his final TT of his career in two thousand. And the statue on the mountain is Joey sat on my bike. It on, is that on, bike. On this one, wow. the Vimto SP One, and and I, I lived on the Alamand for eight years, and I always drove past that every single day because I lived in Ramsey. And I, I went to the gym in Douglas. And every single day, I give it a salute every time I went past. It was wow. a big honor that big honor that that's just statues up with my bike here. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing because I'd heard somewhere down the line that it was linked to you somehow that statue yeah. and the bike and everything. I, I didn't. Wow, that's incredibly cool to be linked. Yeah. You know, well, just with the name, you know, whichever Dunlop it is, it's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, he, <laughs> I say my bike it, at the Northwest Two Hundred. It was my bike. And I think Joey finished fourth, and he um, he uh, <laughs> he experienced the horsepower deficit uh, compared to the uh, the R1 at that point. Right. <laughs> I think it maybe the it was the R7. Remember when Harger ran the R7 that year uh, and and nearly won the championship in 2000 in World Superbikes. And I think I think um, I think the R7 passed Joey down the straight at Northwest, which is a fair bit of straights, isn't he? <laughs> and he came back. And I remember being in the garage at Northwest and Joey coming in absolutely seething because of the horsepower. Uh, and he said to Honda, um, if I don't get a better engine, I'm going to go to Yamaha. Uh, can Ooh. you imagine Joey Dunlop threatening to go to Yamaha with his his, his Honda past? Wow. And, um, and Joey Ooh. Dunlop being Joey Dunlop, <clears throat> HRC flew in Colin Edwards and Aaron Slight's factory SP1 engine World Superbike spec engine to do the TT and he won the senior. Jeez. <laughs> wow. So I don't know if that statue on the Isle of Man is my engine. <laughs> oh, <it's laughs> or, or Colin Edwards is like the like, <laughs> but, but it's definitely the bike. <laughs> it's still my chassis. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's the bit we can all see. Proper job. <laughs> Wow, that's a, that's amazing, and that and that was the start. That was the 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 status of Joey Dunlop HRC. Um, whatever Joey wanted, uh, HRC uh, sorted out for him, and uh, it was in incredible to see how much Honda supported him and how much they loved him for yeah. what for what he did for them around the TT. Yeah, yeah. and rightly so, of course, I, I, on all the roads. Yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> 
So uh, yes, you moved into World Superbike. I mean, you you were pretty on the pace straight off the bat, from what I can remember, just from back then. I mean, you know, you weren't a million miles off at all, were you? Not too bad. I'd, the problem was I'd had eight months off riding at all with this injury yeah. with the thigh, with the femur. And um, so to not ride at all and then to jump on a pretty quick satellite 998 on Dunlops was, uh, compared to my SP1, crikey, made my SP1 feel like a like a, like a a scooter. Uh, sure, so it, was, yeah. it, it, it really, and also um, the Ducati as well, the characteristics of, of that twin was, was quite different to the SP1 and um, but you know, this is where this is where this is why I am then going to be a world champion because of those three years with GSC racing. Colin Wright, how um, organised and strict uh, and disciplined he ran that team for me as a youngster. I was twenty years old, and I needed a a firm uh, headmaster, should we say, to to keep me in check because I had a lot to learn. Yeah. To get up to that speed to be competitive to to warrant keeping my ride and and i really dedicated myself but the team helped me so much and neil hodgson also helped me so much learning how to ride a super bike properly the super sport you've got to keep the corner speed and and keep the momentum going because you haven't got the horsepower super bikes a different riding style all, all, all together you've got to square things off and get it sat up and use the horsepower in a different way right. and neil hodgson and, and gsc racing and hm plant as a uh, sponsor as well. They really took some time with me to, to teach me the skill on how to ride properly. Um, Cause I was 13th in the first year, I think seventh in the second year, and then third, mm -hmm. obviously finishing third, I deserve to keep my ride, but there's not many riders that finish seven, 13th and then seventh, and then still get kept on for a third year in the same team. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm very yeah. thankful. Probably wouldn't that, happen today. Yeah. Of course it wouldn't. Not at all. No, I was really, really lucky that they invested their time greatly in me. And, um, they, yeah, I'd be forever grateful for that. No, absolutely. It just shows that, you know, having a slightly longer term plan. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, with all the money flying around in all sport these days, time isn't something that gets afforded to everyone. So having, as you say, having that third season, you know, but I guess I'd seen the improvement in the second year. They've seen the improvement in you. Um, I was very young. That's what saved me. I, I was still yeah. 20 years old, even though yeah. I'd felt like I'd been racing most of my life. Because, you know, um, when you start your career at 14, then by the time you're 20, you, you, you feel like you've actually, you, 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 you know, you know, pretty much everything. But obviously, you know, that's how you think when you're youngster, isn't it? But, um, but, um, but, but, but yeah, but to finish in the top 10 of World Superbikes at 20 years old <clears throat> um, and have a few crashes, um, luckily for me, there wasn't any other real 20 year olds doing that. Um, right, yeah. and, and, and that gave me a bit more time than most. So, yeah. yeah. And so you had you know, time on your side and let's not forget, I mean, you, you had that first podium at Assen, which is just a monumental circuit. I mean, I, uh, it's the only, it's the only one I've been to in Europe to watch top level. That, that was the old Assen as well. The proper one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before they put kinks and bits and bobs in and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's still brilliant now. I mean, I went to 2018, the MotoGP, um, it was that bonkers race. They said there's something like 378 overtakes or something ridiculous in the race. It was just a bonkers race. Yeah. Mark, Mark Marquez won, obviously. But it's a fantastic circuit, isn't it? Assen. Oh, and then you and, and, and what a place to get your first podium as well. Uh, I it, it, it's not called the Cathedral of Speed for nothing. Uh, Absolutely. Just just the history of it. It's the longest running Grand Prix track on on the Moto Grand Prix calendar um, from the 60s. And it's um, it's a really really special place, and yeah. and and I think I don't I think I always wanted to go with well there because Foggy was so successful, and as a teenager I, and Foggy was a hero of mine when I was when I first started because when I first started in '98, um, I Matt was my first year in international racing in the paddock. Well, that's when Carl Fogarty was the king, yeah, because that he just won his third world title in '98. And um, it was all about Foggy. And if you were at Assen in 98, 99, hearing the crowd go absolutely bonkers when yeah. Keeley fell off at the chicane on that last lap course, and he yeah. come out with his dressing gown on and um, the, the, the show and the, the, the atmosphere was just unbelievable. And I, and I think because of Foggy, because of the crowd reacting to what Foggy did, 
it almost like it adopted British riders at that track and got that level of support because of of that. I don't know. There yeah. is some kind of connection there that you can't can't really describe. And so every time I went to us and every time I went through the, the gates, I knew that it was welcoming to British riders and yeah. for British yeah. success. And I think that really helped. Yeah. And what was it? How did you feel when you got that first podium? Did it feel like a monkey off your back? I mean, did it, or or was it just something that had been building? Because first podiums and first wins are always difficult things. I find it you know to talk about because some people say well, it was coming, so I was relieved, or it was, uh, wow, I've done it, <laughs> I've got on a podium, or, you know. I was um, I was <clears throat> 21 years old, I think, uh, In it was 2002, and so I would have been 21 years old, and I think I'm still the youngest ever Ducati podium runner. Um, I'm, I'm still the youngest ever world champion, but I think I'm still the youngest ever race winner on a Ducati, which is um, quite insane now, saying that's kind of 20, uh, 20 years ago. Um, um, and and I remember I was a bit fortunate because Harger uh, and Hodgson came together with about four laps to go, and they were third and fourth, and I was fifth at that point. And obviously them two going into the gravel uh, promoted me a couple of places, which, which then gifted me my first podium. But I remember standing on the podium with Colin Edwards and Pierre Francesco Keeley, who was... Uh, um, another hero of mine um, and I remember just standing up there and after getting lapped at Brands by Carl Harris after losing my teammate after losing my cousin um, it was it was the first moment and also you know getting a bit of a spanking in super sport at world level for the first time so to keep the belief that I was able to compete at that level yeah. after such a baptism of fire with it and and there were really dark times of doubt that anybody goes through when you're trying to climb the ladder asan 2002 was the first time i went no i can i i, I can do this and wow and there's a real there's a real true belief in it's not it's not thinking it or knowing it it's feeling it you you really feel that you 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 can be competitive and you can achieve your goals that you want to set out for yourself uh, yeah. and when you set the bar high bloody hell um it's such a relief to feel that because it it takes so much to get to that point where you can actually just even even touch that and get close to that and being on the podium there gave me that and and then obviously that kick starts your your next stage in in, in anybody's career yeah absolutely. wow i love that line of, of thinking you can do it but then feeling it yeah i love that it's must be a, you know a huge change in yourself thinking yeah it is it is yeah. it's it's a it's um it's confirmation um to your to yourself but to your being yeah that 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 you you as a human being and and who you are can 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 do it and Wow. And and then forevermore after that Assen race, I woke up in the morning knowing that I could do it. So it was just down to me to, to get the results done rather than wondering, can I do it? Yeah. It's <laughs> Which is a completely can. different approach to it, you know? Wow. It's yeah, it sort of goes from like questioning it to, you know, bring it on type thing. It's that Oh, that's cool. I mean, so, and then I guess the following year, you know, it was a stronger year. You said it was your third. You know, you finished third. You took your first win. Um, <clears throat> we're both we're both frozen, by the way, on the screen. I'm not sure if everybody's. Seen oh, are we? Um, I'm. Reason, but... I I'm still, right? um, still moving. Well, we're both still moving on my screen. Uh, I'm right. sure it'll unlock itself. It could just be a cool a web connection as thing. As, as long as, as I'm not frozen in else. a weird pose. <laughs> Sort of well i have that's why i'm mentioning it <laughs> okay no no you're still moving um awesome. if anyone in the comments awesome. can just confirm that that'd be great thank you um but yeah you got your um you got your first win um in germany again was that a like the similar kind of feeling or was it off the uh, chart do, do you know, germany? um germany the win it was a block out of british riders um I felt really guilty because I'd stopped Hodgson getting the 10th consecutive victory, which would have been the ill record and, yeah. uh, from Edwards. And <laughs> I remember him giving me a right clip around the ear all on the slowing down lap. Um, 
but also being chuffed to bits because obviously the time he'd put into me for the first two years of my career as his teammate, he was in the factory team then and I was still in the same team um, with Chris Walker at that time. And just the genuine, how chuffed he was for me with, because now he knew, he, he was he was the one that knew most of how much I'd, I'd put into it, um, was was really nice. And then to share the, this podium with my teammate as well was, was great for the whole team. Yeah, and then and then what added to it was was um, my sponsor, um, HM Plant, uh, said uh, uh, about buying uh, the piano of my dreams because of it because they'd never had a victory as a satellite team in sure. World Superbike, and I was able to I was fortunate enough to give them that, and then they bought they did buy the piano of my dreams as well. So um, it oh, was a it was a really really special special day in Germany. Wow, that's brilliant, <clears throat> amazing. Um, yeah, so you got that win. It's a great day for the team. I mean, you backed it up. You know, the, uh, you came second at Silverstone, obviously podium on home soil. Um, that must have been very nice as well. Um, and it was a fairly solid end, you know, to to the year, wasn't it? Um, and did it feel like something was building for two thousand and four? Um, yes, I, I'd gone thirteenth, seventh, third. And uh, the, then the two in front of me were going to motor GP. So I thought, well, on 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 paper, <laughs> <laughs> on on paper, I've got no excuses now. <laughs> like two two piranhas have jumped out the tank type thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so I have to thank Ruben Zaus and Neil Hodson for uh, for buggering enough to to motor GP and um, <laughs> making life a little bit simpler for me. But uh, yeah. unfortunately, they. Unfortunately, they left uh, Troy Corsa and Noe Yaga and all the rest of them behind, which was, so it, it still wasn't that easy. But uh, yeah. it, uh, well, it, I mean, it, it gave me the chance to go in in, in the uh, in the factory team. That that's what it, it gave me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was thing Mind you, I wasn't supposed to be in the factory team. I right. was supposed to. I was I was signed for GSE again for the fourth year, and GSE oh. Racing had just done a deal with Honda, and it was going to be the factory Honda HM plant team, and. Um, it was all organized. I was signed for the team. Everything was done. And uh, just as it was all announced, or not, no, to be to be announced, the championship changed from the tire manufacturers to just Pirelli tires. Right. And that annoyed the Japanese manufacturers so much because of their relationships with Michelin and Bridgestone and all the rest of them. Honda pulled out. And when Honda pulled out, GSE Racing could have taken me back to BSB, which they went. Um, yes. And fortunately for me, again, a massive thanks to Daryl Healy and Colin and, and everybody. They released me from my contract and allowed me to go to the factory Ducati team and carry wow. on my World Superbike career, which gave me the world title. But they contractually, they could have um, took me back to BSB. Uh, wow. So they, yeah, they, they could have almost like insisted on it almost or done yeah. something. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so they they tore the contract up luckily and uh, and let me move on. Yeah. Wow, I had no idea. Goodness. Yeah, because um, you remember the do you remember the black Honda H M plant Hondas in in BSB with Haslam and uh, yeah and Cal Crutchlow roll Cr yeah them. yeah I think um, so that was supposed to be the World Superbike um, team. And, and oh wow, and they were, I had no idea. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot of people did because it was really confidential at the time that because wow. H because Honda were going to come back full factory. Because they'd had a couple of years out for factory after Colin Edwards in 2002. Wow. Goodness me. Right. Yeah. Wow. The things you learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just before we get into 2004, I mean, there was I mean, there were some amazing names that you were racing against in those for, in that first three seasons. I mean, you know, you mentioned about Troy Bayless, Colin Edwards, Troy Corsa. You know, you, know, you mentioned about like Keely and Zaus and Harger and Walker and Hayden. I mean, to to get the results that you did, you know, with the win and podiums and stuff, that's, that's a heck of a shot in the arm that you're mixing it with those guys because, you know, they're quite good, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, and to be honest, when I, when I joined the Factory Ducati team, I was, I, was, I was just about getting the hang of racing at the front of World Superbikes, but I was certainly a bit of a step behind Baylis and Edwards and Laconi and Harga uh, uh, for for the majority of the year, that's for sure. Um, but luckily joining a factory team with Davide Tadotzi and all of the amazing engineers at that level in in the factory teams, uh, they, they, they again, helped me find that next step 
of being able to ride that fast, that consistent. Um, because it's not just riding fast, it, it's riding fast and then staying consistent with it, which yeah. takes a lot of experience, knowing all the tracks, knowing all the corners, knowing the tires, which was also tricky for me because I done all of my learning riding motor, uh, super bikes on Dunlops in one, two, and three with GSC H implant. And then the one tire roll came in 2004 with Pirelli and the 999 Ducati had done all its development on Michelin's as well. So when we first put the bridge, uh, the Pirelli's in, on, uh, in the factory Ducati team, even, even the G factory team were struggling a bit because um, it, it hadn't been developed on these, on that tire. So it was, it was a difficult, on paper, it should have made life easy joining the factory team, but the tire thing made it really, really complicated right. for myself, for the engineers on being able to be really fast, but consistent with it. Cause to be really, really consistent, the most important thing to understand is your tire right. for everything, for the rider, for the engineers, for the electronics engineers, knowing where the grip is, at what times of the race and the laps and the corners and the lean angle, like it, that, that is the most fundamental thing on getting a setup there for the rider to, to, to ride around as fast as possible. And the rider to be able to ride right on the edge of the, the grip level without crashing. Because if you don't understand the tire, you don't get that. So it, it was tricky at first. Wow. And again, I mean, that's all the things that, you know, non-racers don't think about, <laughs> you know, it's the, the difference in the tyres and all the other things like that. And obviously with the bike being set up previously, wow, well, yeah, I can imagine a bit of a steep learning curve. Um, <clears throat> but going into 2004, I mean, it, you know, despite that, it certainly clicked. I mean, you hit the ground running. I mean, you know, you took, was it first and second in the opening round? And um, I did, but my teammate crashed twice. And if he hadn't have crashed yeah. twice, he would have beaten me twice at Valencia. Okay, sure. yeah. Yeah. He was fast. But Laconi at the beginning of the year, even even like halfway through the year, Laconi was he was quite a bit faster than me. But um, luckily, with the factory bike and the speed I had, I, I never really finished off the podium. Um, yeah. Because of the manufacturers pulling out with Honda, uh, and, and uh, it was it was quite it was a bit of a Ducati Cup that year, and even though everybody was getting used to the tyres, at least I was on one of the best Ducatis. So right. that, that gave me, on a bad day, I was third, not sixth, you know? Right, um, right. it gave you that. Was, yeah. I, so I was clocking up the points. And Laconi was such a fiery-headed Frenchman that um, <laughs> even if he was two seconds faster than everybody, he pushed round risking crashing. And the inconsistency really, really hampered him at the beginning of the season. Yeah, and he had a few dropouts. Kept me, yeah, it kept me in the hunt of the championship all the way through the year because of that. And halfway through the year, Laconi should have been comfortably in the lead of the championship. Right. And um, he wasn't because of his inconsistency. And unfortunately for him, halfway through the season, I got the hang of it. Um, right. And then took the battle right to the end in France against him as a French rider. And really, you don't really want the last race to be at your home place with all the pressures that that brings and the expectations. And and I would think I was about five or six points behind. And I had nothing to lose. And yeah, um, and it was yeah, it was a it, it was it was tricky because the teams got two riders in the last race going for the championship. David Tadotsi didn't know what which way to look really. Um, they had to make a decision who was going to be the champion before the weekend. So the World Superbike Champion was going to go to America to ride in the last race of the American Championship as a promotion. They'd already booked Laconi's flights. They'd already planned all that. And I, <laughs> really? And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was going to Mugello to test the, the new thing, traction control. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, 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 the new thing. Um, wow. And but But they had to do all that planning because the amount of promotion that winning a championship brings to a manufacturer manufacturer is 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 huge so all of the posters all of the flyers all of the all the all of the pr that you can think of um everything you know we don't we don't you know it wasn't going to be decided until sunday of the races who was going to win but laconi was six points in the lead and it was his home race yeah so if you're a betting man <laughs> it just done the double at imola as well the week before i, yeah. I was we finished like that over the line. It was close. 
um, but um, it certainly that's why they put their, their their eggs in that basket a bit, which they had to do. Yeah. And again, just I will always be forever thankful for Davide Tadazzi and the team, my team especially, and and all of Ducati for giving me a bike that I could still win on, regardless because. If they didn't want me to win that championship and they did want Laconi to win after all the promotion now all the money that they spent on predicting that um they could have they could have easily done something to, to they to, could have made it happen to make it happen and they yeah. didn't and um it was a, it was a it was an unusually an unusual celebration uh of winning a championship when one side's lost and the other one's not and yeah so it, it was it was quite muted but it was um you know, uh, as you can imagine, uh, to to achieve your lifetime dreams of, of being a world champion is mm. uh, is indescribable, and um, and for, yeah, forever forever grateful for David Tadotsi and Ducati for even though they plan different things, they still gave me an opportunity to 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 take victory. Yeah, keeping it like level enough, um, as it yeah. were. Yeah. I mean, when you're on the cusp of something, you know, as you say, your you know your lifelong dream you know it's a world championship it's world superbike it's you know it's 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 the top um <clears throat> there's one race to go and i mean do you remember what you were thinking or what was going through your mind was it is it a case of i mean i guess you don't as a professional as an athlete as a racer you don't you try not to allow the negative thoughts into your head the god i better not drop it what if I drop it? What's going to happen? How am I going to feel if I, if it doesn't go my way? Did did that ever come into your head? Of course, yeah. I mean, the one <clears> thing that that does go through your head is is um, I was twenty three years old, so um, you you think you've got enough experience to to kind of overcome these pressures, but when I look at my twenty three year old nephew now. I look at him and I think, crikey, that was a lot to take on and a lot to cope with mm. at, at, at that age that I see him at now because it is quite young. Um, but because because when I was 17 in Castrol Honda and I got two broken ankles and I lost my teammate and I was in Castrol Honda with the help of Edwards and Aaron Slight and and Chris Herring and, 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 and Neil Tuxworth and, and all of those very experienced people, um, by the time I was 23 years old, on the grid in a factory Ducati, I, 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 I just had enough help and support from everybody to know the bike, know the tyres, know every single corner of Magni since 1998, riding around there, um, or whenever it came on the calendar, enough to... I was sat on the grid, and I just had to just get everything right. I, I didn't have to think, I don't really know section three that well. Where do I overtake? What's the easiest place to overtake? Um, how do I look after the rear tire around some corners? And no, Even at 23, I knew all of that. Wow. So um, it was just about snap your visor down and you don't look up until that checkered flag comes up and make no mistakes and that kind of focus. Um, and that's why... That's why I'll always thank for the people that I worked with since I was 17 years old, because um, I, I'm still the youngest world champion, but it was because of all those people I worked with since 17 that it put me in a position in 2004 at Magni Corps, race two, there was three or four points in it. Whoever won, won. Yeah. And it was game on. I mean, on Wednesday before the weekend, Davide Tadotsi had a meeting with me and told me the story that they had to <coughs> predict the winner. And Laconi was going to America, and I was going to Mugello, and and unfortunately they had they had to have chosen the winner before the weekend started. Right. Well, right. I think if they wanted that to have happened, I think don't think they should have told me that before the weekend started because yeah. maybe me I marched straight back to my little caravan and went, well that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing they could have done was tell you. <laughs> it was, yeah. Goodness and me. I, and I thought, no way, no, no, I'm, I'm, I, I have no. not, I, I've not put a season together like I had done that year, uh, and then to be in a position at the very last round to take in the title, um, um, and it, it, he didn't tell me that he wanted me to finish second by any means, but for the team boss to have predicted himself and 
that Laconia would be victorious, um, just naturally, again, because any competitive sportsman has it in them. Um, they, it's just, it's just like a red rag to a bull. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like your team manager thinks he's going to win. Right. Okay. I'm going to prove you wrong, but not nothing negative on David Tadotsi at all. Um, because mm. I have to thank David Tadotsi for doing it because I, I woke up Friday morning and I don't think, I, I don't think I made one mistake all weekend. <laughs> um, I, 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 I think I, I think I qualified second or even pole and, and I won the first race. Mm. And then in the second race, Harga was pestering me and, and Laconi was a, a couple of seconds off in third. And, and, and I wouldn't say it was comfortable by any means, but um, it, I was in such a zone because of that meeting on Wednesday. Yeah, um, it, I, I don't think I've ever been fire. as focused. Yeah, I don't think I've ever been as focused um, wow. in a weekend ever. Yeah, so. I'm, not, I'm not surprised. That's amazing. I can't believe they told you. See me. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah, but but, but they, they, they told me in courtesy, actually, because yeah, I think yeah. they realised I was going to find out because there was no T-shirts. There was no number ones with the 52 in them for the photographs at the end of it. There was no real, there was there, there was no fanfare at all um, yeah. organised. And and I never saw the boxes of T-shirts with Laconi's world championship winning trophy, uh, world championship winning year on. I don't know where they went. Um, <laughs> Um, there might but, be in a bin in central France yeah. somewhere. <laughs> but, but like, um, but David Tadotsi did did tell me, um, in good faith, because he, he would realise that I would have noticed a few things afterwards, um, that um, that things were, were were planned ahead of that weekend, that the world superbike champion was not going to America. He was going testing traction control and. And he didn't. He didn't want me to think. Oh wow! I didn't been disappointed that they hadn't told me. So it was a tricky one for them. They'd, yeah. They'd, yeah. They'd never had. They'd had one twos before with Hodgson and Zaus and uh, Bayliss and I don't know Foggy and Keely or but um, you know Bayliss and his teammates. I can't remember. But and Bayliss and Zaus. You know they had, they had one one twos many years. But then they they very rarely. I don't think if ever had both riders going for the championship at the last race. Ironic. Yeah. And that's weird, isn't it? When you think of the Fatshu Jukatsu team. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so it was it was new new to them, and and it was a tricky situation, and um, yeah, it was. I mean, I feel for Laconi because Laconi deserved it just as much as I did that particular year. Yeah. Um, I just got it right at the end, basically, and yeah, uh, it. Uh, but the differences in life um, of me forevermore being a world champion from that day, and him never winning uh, a yeah. world championship after that day. Uh, it, it's it's immeasurable the the differences in life um, opportunities and and respect and accolade that you get from from forever being a world champion and um, I'll always have a lot of respect for for, for Regis Lacone he was just as fast as me that year and faster at the beginning and um, it's a shame he wasn't a world champion but Nori Harger Pierre Francesco Keeley Aaron Slight you know that the list goes on that that should have won because they were just as talented as most people. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, to see a comment uh, from um, uh, Oliver Taylor. Um, he's uh, he's from Huddersfield area, and he says, "Ah, oh, they 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 forgot you had the one thing uh, that Mister Laconi didn't, and that's Yorkshire grit." There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be hey, joking aside, it was a bit something. It yeah. was. It was um, because because being a um, being being from a certain region um, breeds certain people. Yeah. And and when you have to wake up on a Sunday morning and you've got to get two full races completely right and you've got to do lap times within 0.4 of a second from first to the last lap uh, on a motorcycle or doing 200 miles an hour, they, it takes a certain it takes a certain person to be able to to yeah. to, to, to get yourself into that kind of like mental mentality. And, and how much success does Yorkshire get at sports level? It's huge, right? Remember the last Olympics or something where, where Yorkshire won more goals than, than Australia or something? It was some yeah. it was some kind of stat, remember? And it's just across all, but yeah, even in you know, football and cricket and, you know, even like Danny Willett, the golfer, won the Masters from Sheffield, you know. You know yeah. um, it is. It yeah, is. There's something, something there is something about an upbringing, for sure, that, uh, yeah. that you know, that you've got to fight for it. Mm. Yeah. Which I can vouch for because my mum's from Batley, just outside me, and well, never get on the wrong it. side of me, man. Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, no. 
Yeah. Hey, I'm talking about Hud talking about Huddersfield as well with that with that question. It's nice to see Tom Sykes back on on the Griffin yeah. World Bikes next year again. So yeah, he's back as a team. Yeah, good to see Tom back on there. Um, I've got to ask. I mean, we saw how much it meant to you when it crossed the line. It was that look of you know, hands were on the head. Your the head was down. You were up. You were. It was like. What was? I mean, was it a case of bloody hell? I've done it. All the effort. Yeah, all the work, it was. All the, that, that, honestly, Yorkshire's that was just. Oh. It was as Yorkshire as that as I crossed the line. <laughs> <laughs> bloody hell! I've done it. <laughs> oh, <no. Yeah>. Um <laughs> <laughs> it was it, I, wow. it, it, because the checkered flag at, at Magnico is in the perfect place when you're trying to win a world championship. It's literally as you exit the corner and there's no yeah, chance of thing. getting past, you know? So it's not like you, it's not like, uh, can you imagine like Phillip Island where you come out the last corner, you think you've got it, you think you've got it. Then you just get slipstreamed at the line. By somebody track, else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Magni Court, when you know you go into the last corner in the lead, you know, you've won it. So that was, that was a huge relief um, of just even the track layout. But, uh, but yeah, I, I put my hand in my, uh, you know, my head in my hands and um, it was really, really emotional um, yeah. to, you know, getting started in this game, in this amazing sport, in such a, um, uh, an unusual way, really. Uh, didn't really, it wasn't really uh, uniform to, to what other riders kind of introductions were to it from like Leon Aslan with his dad, et cetera, or yeah. someone that was involved in racing that they got the sons involved. It was nothing like that for me. And um, and then obviously not having the person that started me uh, in racing, not being there to see yeah. to see me achieve what what we kind of would set out um, was, um, it was, it was amazing. It was confusing. It was it was emotional. It was um, I also had to 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 be very respectful for for Regis's side of the garage and Regis to not to not not spray champagne everybody on everybody and and, yeah. and overdo that in their faces. So it, it was wow. quite tame. It was to <clears throat> to come into the park for me and and have your ha Mum's one thing. Mum's quite easy to make make a cry with pride. Um, even even when I played the piano at grade three, I was I was making a cry. So <laughs> I knew that was the, I knew that was a done deal. But Tick. yeah, to make your older brother cry, no, oh. no, that is an achievement. I can tell yeah. you, um, especially uh, especially Yorkshire brothers. Yeah, um, yeah. He was he was absolutely sobbing his heart out, and uh, it Brilliant. was. Uh, and I had his oldest son who was uh, about five at the time. And he was on the podium with me with his little sets and set of leathers on. I got made for him and he was on the podium with me. He's 23 now, which is crazy. But um, so to, to make all the team and your family, in order with a like cry out loud uh, for, for, for hours on end uh, was, uh, uh, is, is just a, a really special treat that you can, that you can give people. Wow. I can only imagine. Wow. That's amazing. Amazing. Um, just fast forward from that. I mean, obviously, two thousand and five. Well, yeah, two thousand and five. It was like consistent, but then um, you know, Troy Corsa rocks up on the the GSX R one thousand and just I mean, crikey! I, mean, I can remember thinking, where the hell did that come from? Yeah, he was, that's when that's when thousand CC four cylinders were allowed back in. And yeah, crikey, yeah. I mean, that's when that's and he when he won six uh, of the first seven didn't he i think ah uh, it, 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 it used to, it used to be 754s against uh, 1000 cc twins and then and then the, the 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 japanese complained about that so then then they went the same all thousands with four cylinder and two cylinder that's when the japanese dominated again and then it crept up with the twins didn't it to 1100 and 1200 uh, yeah um and then bayless was back on it again so um but yeah, the, the, the Suzuki that year in 2005 was incredible. I, I, it's a, I, it's a, a pretty impossible to retain my title. I had a massive crash testing traction control in Qatar. And I, I nearly finished third in the end. I, I nearly beat Arga, I think, in the end, but I, I finished fourth in the championship. But I yeah. mean, I nearly lost my job finishing second in 2004 with Ducati. So finishing fourth, it was a guarantee that I was going to lose my job. And I did. And, and I had to yeah. go to Honda. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I remember, I mean, you said that, you know, you lost that ride uh with Ducati and I remember it made you almost angry because of how it what had happened and what you'd done with Ducati and I mean what 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 happened with it because you ended up going you know to the you know to the satellite Honda team as you said but what happened there because I remember there was a lot of people who were like oh 
um, I, I remember walking through the paddock and Davide Tadotsi was walking through the paddock at um, the penultimate race in 2005. And he came up and he said, James, um, I've been talking to Ronald and Garrett Tenkata and, and they're quite interested in you for next year, you know, and, uh, and walked off. Um, I went, ah. Oh. <laughs> If, if, that's not, if that's not the biggest hint, <laughs> I think you better go and talk to somebody else next year. Um, I don't know what wow. is. Yeah. But that's and the Fatu Ducati team. Look, I mean, I, I, I finished fourth on a Fatu Ducati, right? You do not keep your ride finishing fourth well, on a Fatu Ducati, you know? Yeah, they, it, they I guess it doesn't matter who you're against, I guess. Yeah. No, they employ people to win because they know their bike can and should and will. And I had no problems with that. I, I, um, if I'd have finished second in 2004, you know, I would have lost my ride then. Wow. That would have been harsh a bit at 23. That would have been, yeah. But yes, yeah, so, tw- so finishing fourth was not a surprise that I lost my job. And so it's, uh, um, I had five years with Ducati, amazing five years. Davide Tadotsi, Paolo Ciabatti, all the team. Um, they will, they will be dear, dear, dear friends of mine for life. Um, this is a, this is a, this is a, an amazing game and sport but but results have to count no matter what relationships you've got no matter what friendships you've got the sponsors are putting hundreds of thousands and millions of pounds into allowing people to have a career yeah. and and they expect victories and um and everybody's on the payroll to to re- to get victories and if the rider is not, unfortunately, that the, the 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 fingers pointed quite firmly at the rider for performances in a factory Ducati team, rightly so. If you don't win and uh, if you don't perform, you're out. And and uh, I I had no problems with that. Um, and I, through that winter, though, once again, it sparked a fire in me that uh, rejection was something that I hated, and and I was going to do the best I can on a Honda to to. Uh, to prove that uh, Ducati's wrong, which, you know, just again, I have to thank Ducati for that because uh, I've never ridden so well in my whole career than I did on a Honda as well. So because of that. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> just before we get into 2007, which is obviously the season, first season with the Honda, um, uh, just from looking, the, just from looking back, first. sorry, six, sorry. Um, yeah, just yeah. From look, just looking back, um, oh, sorry, for that 2006 season, the, something that popped up as I was looking at, you know, notes and things. Was like Craig Jones. It was his only World Superbike season, and obviously he was very sadly lost at Brands. Um, did you did you know Craig at all? Or? I knew Craig very very well, and you did. Okay. Um, it, it was another tragic tragic loss because, like Chrissy, Craig was such a he was he was he was a just just a, a mobile walking talking party was Craig. Um, yeah, and I have um. I have, I have a really personal story that I've, I've not really told, I don't think, to to, to, to any chats or podcasts, really. Um, I was really good friends with the family, and they, they called me when he'd had the accident, and he was in hospital, and I was mm. at a wedding. Because it was, it was a at Brands, was, wasn't was a, it? It was a Brands, yeah, and I, I yeah. was at a wedding in Leicester uh, on that day, um, and I, was, I got a phone call uh, from his girlfriend, um, and... I then jumped in the car, left the wedding, jumped in the car, and I and I and I raced down to to the hospital as quick as I could, and uh, and I walked in, and he was on the uh, the life support machine, and I walked into his room, and his dad asked me just to talk to him, because um, he thought it might help, and um, as I as I held his hand, the the machine went flat, and and we lost him, and and his dad hugged me outside in tears and said that's he waited for you, James, and. That's my um, really personal story about Jeez. losing my dear friend Craig Jones, and uh, I think after all this time, I think um, you know, let's just remember all of these riders that put their lives on the line and and put this amazing show on for everybody. Absolutely, um, and Absolutely. Uh, Steve's dad and and all his family, and um, he will be forever remembered, and he will um, always be a dear friend of mine. I honestly didn't know that you knew him that well or that story. I hope you didn't feel obliged to answer that. I, that's kind of that's kind of blindsided me a bit. Um, but no, well, thank you for yeah. I was yeah. It was just one of those things that popped up in my notes. Yeah, I didn't realise that I, I you think, were close. So apologies if that's brought anything up. No, but. not at all. I think to, I think talking about it, it 
it just shows you how real it is this sport mm. and, and how special it is and what people put on the line for this amazing sport and yeah uh, and, and for the show because it is a show at the end of the day and and unfortunately it's uh, it's taken some you know some really really good people uh, far 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 too too young um but um but i think it's a good thing to talk about it and mm. to you know for everybody to i mean i know people appreciate it i think I think the one lovely thing about being a motorcycle racer, being a sportsman with the fans, especially is how much you respect that you do get, you know, you're not a footballer, which everybody in the football stadium think they can do a better job than you, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's not many people in the grandstands at Brands Arch come over to you and go, you a bit slow through turn two, JT. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, uh, you know, you could have you could have overtaken him into turn one um, or whatever. Uh, it's there's a real appreciation and a respect that fans have for riders and and riders feel that. And and it's a really, really special relationship. And it's yeah. a special atmosphere at a race meeting with 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 the fans because of that. It's uh, um, it's um, yeah, it's and, and it's because of that. And it's because of the, the danger, because of the losses. And they are great losses as well. It's the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah, and we should uh, we should salute every one of them. Yeah, I absolutely echo that. You know, you don't get the armchair experts at bike racing. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, but just sort of touching on two thousand six, you came second overall. Obviously, uh, you know, your first season with Honda, second overall. Confidence fairly high going into two thousand seven. I would imagine. Um, I mean, to me, that year is it. It's it's the year of world superbike in my mind um just for you know people like yourself and who you're up against you know you're up against like bayless and hager and corsa and in my mind you guys were the big four it was like you guys were like and biagi biagi was there as well and Max, biagi came in um yeah. he sort of came straight in and was straight on the pace wasn't he i mean what a four yeah. and five riders you know to be heading it all up um I've got here that you was it you won three of, sort of four races and it, it was all sort of going well at the start. Did you even even against those kinds of guys were you thinking we we yeah we 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 can win this? Yeah yeah because um because... I fought with I fought with Bayliss in two thousand and six quite heavily yeah and um I beaten him on a on a few occasions that year. He was quite dominant in the championship and took the championship, but I pushed him quite a few occasions and. It was my first time on a, on a four cylinder Honda and fire blade, and it was quite a different thing to adapt to. But I felt again halfway through the year, I'd kind of got the hang of it, and I was like, I was pushing him, and I was. Um, and then one massive, massive confidence booster for me, probably the biggest confidence booster, and it wasn't even what I did on a bike. It was Bailey's going to Valencia on as a wild card in MotoGP and blitzing it and won at Valencia on a Ducati with Caparossi, and. Um, I thought, crikey, I've been pushing that like round all year. I'm beating him a few times. Um, it was when Nicky Hayden, like bless him again, um, yeah. uh, he won the championship that year. And Bailey says a wild card went in and won the race. I mean, yeah. I don't, I can't remember the last time somebody did that. It must have been like one of the Japanese riders in Japan or something, you know, you know, no. back, back in the day. So it was incredible. And I was at the side of the track and all of a sudden I was like, hang on a minute. I can not only possibly try and beat Troy Bailey next year in 2007. I've got me Aaron Rossi now, you know, um, and that was a massive, massive um, thing uh, that what, wow. what Bayliss did that particular weekend that day that uh, gave me the belief of just how good I was getting, you know. Yeah, and you could mix it with him who had gone and just done that. Yeah. 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 And then obviously, you know, when wow. I went back after that, uh, um, you know, Max Biaggi and um, Noriaga and Corsa and, uh, it, you know, really, really fast people. I mean, yeah, I mean, I was I was up there with them, but on their day, crikey, they were they were really you know, pain in the backside to to beat. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah, I mean, obviously, as fans watching it, it's brilliant. But for you, you got to be thinking, oh, bugger off, will you? <laughs> Just go. Oh, no. I, I, my life could have been a lot easier if. if, if 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 when Zaus and, and Odson went to GP and it would have just been that bunch of riders for the rest of my career, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> life would have been much easier. <laughs> it would have been nice if Bagnus and Corsa and Hager had taken up golf or something. When <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> much nicer. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, as far as we're in the season, you took first and second uh, in the Czech Republic. I remember that sort of race, and then Brands Hatch. Uh, we, we touched on it. 
Um, I was I I was there. Um, <laughs> very very glad to say. Um, I have never. Well, I tell a lie. I've never heard a noise and seen a crowd at an event like that in the UK. I went to the Indianapolis 500 this this past May, which is half a million people down there, uh, which is nuts. But that weekend at Brands Hatch, it didn't feel like Brands Hatch. It just, it, it was just absolutely amazing. Obviously on the back of what you were doing, everyone had come to see you do your thing. And um, you did it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it was like it was like winning the Champions League, wasn't it? It was. It was. It was, it was, it was like the World Cup. It was like it was just. It was massive. Well, um, there, there was a, there was one hundred twenty six thousand there, so yeah. that that would have. Um, to, I mean, it was. Um, to, you know, over the COVID couple of years that we've just unfortunately had, mm. um, we raced there with with no crowd at all. I when when I was at the track with no crowd allowed in, and I was like, oh my god just realized how fortunate I was to ride in it in an era. Yeah. And that time, that day, it runs my only double ever in my whole career. Um, course, and playing yeah. the national anthem and 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 get getting that response and, and that memory. I mean, you're talking about it now with excitement still. And as a that, fan, and I was just watching, so God yeah. knows what it's like for you. I mean But that's how special it was, wasn't it, Brands actually yeah. in two thousand and seven for myself and for everybody else. And 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 again, it all comes back to my grand playing the piano at Christmas, right? This is who I am and what I do, right? I did something there that day that my grand started playing Christmas carols and it started the party. And me going there and doing the double was was just that. That's all it was. Yeah. That's all it was about. It, it doesn't matter about the trophy. It doesn't matter about winning. It didn't matter it's... about like 66 points in the lead of the championship at that point. I think it was and I nearly like wrapped it up at that point and, and all of the things. It was just I was able to create this, and that's what life's about. Yeah. You created one heck of a day. I mean, it, it was. I mean, yeah. even now I'm looking back and I'm sort of smiling about it. It, it was just unreal. I mean, I mean, you obviously won. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you won both races. Obviously, um, um, Troy dropped it in the second race, which obviously gave you that healthy sort of lead. I mean, what, but one thing I wondered though. I mean, the racket. I mean, we could hear the crowd over the bikes, which I've never, I've, I've never experienced that at any sporting event ever. It was that loud. I mean, could, can you hear that? I did. I did at Brands. At Brands, you can because you can hear Druids, it. When when you go through Druids Turn Two, it's a bit of a hairpin, and, and yeah. obviously the engines let drop, and um, yeah. it was a it was a twin cylinder as well, so the resonation was quite low, yeah. uh, and 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 it was the ear of the air horns. Oh my god. <laughs> The I, mean, I, I couldn't I, I couldn't hear when to shift um it was <laughs> it was so loud it was and like you could hear cheering yeah i could hear cheering in my helmet which um i can still hear now and brands Act was the only one to provide you with 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 that and it's it just it's so so special really yeah. really special incredible did you previously plan to chuck your leathers over the fence <laughs> or was it <laughs> i did I did, but only because I, but only because of how comfortable I was um, in the uh, um, in, in the first race. So I just mentioned I was on the twin. I was thinking I was on the Ducati. I was on the Honda. I wasn't on the twin. I was on the four, mm. but I still couldn't hear it. So, um, but yes, yes I, I did plan it uh, because I put a <laughs> I put a set of leathers behind the podium. <laughs> oh right, <laughs> before the second race, <laughs> I said take them up there because <laughs> I'm going to chuck these in when I win and. Uh, that's 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 the level it gets to when when things really? are when things are rocking and rolling and the confidence is up the team's working well the bike's working well you can you can be while you're getting your leathers on you can have the brain capacity of freedom to just go I just knit these up to the podium will you because I'll be I'll be needing because... them to get changed into um, I mean the audacity and bloody Oh, the ego of it when I think about it now is just off the scale in it but it's just how that was at that point there was just I knew there was no one to beat me that day and um but it's brilliant and I yeah it's it's a it, it's a, a very uh you're very blessed to 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 be in such a situation at the top level of sport to have everything around you to allow you to kind of be that way it's it's, it's a really really nice feeling fantastic what a day love that um obviously great day big championship lead um 
potential blip, qualifying little accident. At, yeah, uh, second, yeah. At, at Valle Longa. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. I thought you meant Branzo was second. It, yes, the, no, second. when yeah. later on you sort of dropped it in qualifying and had to come through <laughs> from the back. But, um, I mean, it's, it's, it could have been disastrous. But you came through and you took third, was it? I think you took third on the in the race. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, yeah. And not something yeah, like that. Steadied the ship, I guess. So yeah, saved it, but risky tr- overtaking all those people while you're trying to be consistent. But yeah, yeah, look. Yeah. But that was the first time I've been at that track, and again, that just shows you new track for me, trying to consolidate a world championship, and um, I was uh, I was just trying to put a lap together in qualifying, which would then have given me the results. But I was on a on a really tight hairpin that I wasn't fully um, mm-hmm. up to speed with, and it caught me out and. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a left hander, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's always difficult on new tracks trying to kind of uh, push 100%. So, but but luckily, everybody, it was new for everybody else except for Max Biaggi, obviously, because it was in Rome, Valle Longa, and Max Biaggi had done a lot of laps on there. So he was really difficult to beat, but uh, um, it was it was the same for everyone. Yeah, that's cool. Um, final race, uh, you know, a bit more of a not relaxed, but it was, you know, it wasn't quite as close and you know as scary as it was in 2004 and there wasn't all the politics i guess um you had the, your, your teammate was on your side this time uh which obviously which obviously helps um uh, you needed was it you need uh, i can't remember was it you needed sixth wasn't it um but you had yeah. a, what was it was it the was it the first race or the second race you had a bit of an incident turn one and went through the gravel yeah. and lorenzo Lanzi think, took yeah, me out, thinking, yeah. oh, no not having this oh my god <laughs> Well, I, I I qualified on pole, I think. I got, I really yeah. I really put a good lap together, so I thought that that's it. I'm on pole position. I only need to finish in the top six. Um, there isn't five people to beat me on this Honda. I'm fine. <laughs> uh, just as you think things are fine. The one rule not to do in racing or in sport, professional sport, can get complacent. Yeah, yeah. And um, never think it's I, all right. <laughs> exactly. I went into turn one. Lorenzo Lanzi, bless him, is a good kid, Lorenzo. <laughs> He got it a bit wrong and took me and Biaggi out. And me and, me and Biaggi going through the gravel at turn one, which is fast, um, about 130 mile an hour down the hill. And luckily, we get away with it and we get on the track last and second to last. And um, uh, I followed Biaggi around for the whole race. He was really fast on the Suzuki. Um, we finished seventh and eighth, I think it was, mm. which which then I had to finish in the top six in the second race. And after being really comfortable, if I'd have been on the podium in that first race, I would have just had to score a couple of points and it had been done. But to just finish in the top six and just get the points, uh, you've just seen it with Francesco Bagnaia. Yeah. You can't, you can't go any faster, right? I is was bumbling around. Is it hard to know what to do? Because well, you're just trying to you're just trying to protect it and consolidate your lead, and you're just trying to like be careful. Well, if you try and be careful against the world's best, you're going to get a right old spanking again. And like, you're going to go backwards, yeah. Uh, I think I was like third, and then fourth, then fifth, and like people like overtaking me, which I would have beaten comfortably if I hadn't have had this monkey on my back. Yeah. Um, and then, and then um, I got back to six, and I thought, oh my god, I'm going to lose a world championship. And just as I went back to six on my pit board, it went. Rolfo, seventh. And I was like, oh, thank God for that. Because Rolfo was my teammate and I knew he had team orders. (laughs) (laughs) So he wasn't going to try anything. So he he wasn't. The the person behind me wasn't able to overtake. The one person you wanted behind you. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, literally, and I couldn't have gone any faster. God, it was so frustrating. And I bet the team were like, what is he doing? But uh, I could not go any faster than six that day. I needed six. I got six. I got the championship for them. And yeah. First independent team to kind of win the championship. and Which was and, amazing. Uh, and amazing. also, also, um, also, we were able to celebrate fully as well because I, I couldn't celebrate fully with the Ducati one. And, uh, there, there was no consideration for the team X. He wasn't in the hunt for the championship. So we had a party and 10K, 10 k know how to party, I tell you. Um, um, <laughs> so that was, it was lovely. It was, it was nice to win the championship again after getting sacked from Ducati and, and them losing belief in me. Um, and uh, so it, it was nice to, to do that for myself uh, and prove that. It was nice to win on two manufacturers, which there's only ever been two people to do ever in Superbike yeah. with me and Corsa. And um, that's and, a cool thing to have. That's a very yeah. Cool thing to have. 
Yeah. Uh, so it was it was it was the party that I hoped winning a world championship should have been. Um, right. So at yeah. least at least I was able to celebrate uh, in true fashion for for the first time on winning the championship. But it was it was good. Yeah, I bet that was a good night. <clears throat> Not going to offer details. Don't worry. It was a um, good night, but an awful morning. <laughs> <laughs> Long day the following day. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I want to finish six on Monday. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Um, so, so the next move, um, MotoGP, um, was that always the the plan? Was it something that was being worked on, or since it... since Valencia two thousand and six with Bayliss, it, it it was um, right with what he did. You thought I can? Yeah, yeah. Because all of a sudden, <clears throat> it wasn't really my plan. I didn't. I just wanted to just ride motorbikes and just keep winning. You know, that was my only objective really in the sport. And it wasn't. It didn't matter where it was or what, which championship. I just wanted to keep doing that. And with Bayliss doing that. It then put MotoGP eyes on on me um, as a, a potential rider that could be competitive at that level because I was riding against Bayliss and being competitive with him. He'd won, so obviously then it it, it made it, all the superbike riders look very good, you know. And um, and they also didn't have a British rider. Uh, and uh, Dorna came to Brands Hatch and saw that. I didn't pull all of the 126,000 funds, but I know I pulled quite a few in as the British rider, you know, uh, for the a interest. Percentage. <laughs> um, so obviously then the MotoGP pilot were like, wow, we, we need that guy in our championship to sell the tickets, to sell the merchandise, to sell television, especially because BBC were covering it uh, that, that year as well. Um, so uh, they needed a British, a competitive British rider in that championship as part of their show and uh, that's why I got the opportunity when when I did that. That's for, that's for sure. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I mean, I was just looking at the names on the grid there. I mean, of the MotoGP, I was like Casey Stone and you know. You know yeah, I went, I went to a really bad period. <laughs> Milandri, Caparossi, Gibernau, Hayden, some Italian fella, Valentino, something. <laughs> um, crikey! I mean, what? Yeah. What a grid! Um, and, uh, did you I should have thought. I should, I, I should have. I should have thought about it, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but if you want to compete against the best, I mean, goodness me! I mean, that was a hell of a roll call. Um, no, well, it always is. But I mean, that was pretty amazing. I mean, was it ever sort of daunting, even even though you had your you know an, an experienced teammate? Uh, yes, of course, of, of course. Um, when. When I, when, when I signed for Yamaha and I was in the same Yamaha camp and I was doing all the pre-season promotions with uh, with Colin, my teammate, and Jorge Lorenzo and Valentino Rossi. And um, it's not just about racing against these guys. When you socialise with Valentino Rossi at events and promotional events, you're, you're no longer motorcycle racers. Right. You're superstars. Yeah, or he was, and and when when you did events and stuff, it was chaos, absolute chaos, because of Valentino, and it was just like, crikey, it's like it's like it's like a footballer, it's like it's like hanging around with David Beckham, wow. and it, it it was it was completely a different, it was a different way of <clears throat> of doing the job, of going about the job, of what the job was about. It wasn't like you were fairly kind of inconspicuous as where you went into the track and you got a bit of fuss and that, but it, it was just off the scale. Um, you just couldn't get about. And like, it was just a different way of, completely different way of doing a job. And, and it was fascinating. Um, and that was off track. On track, crikey. Um, me and Colin in Tectoire, still the same at the minute with the tech to our ktm it's they've never had they've never had such a, a competitive package compared to the factory boys and we had the slowest bikes on the grid unfortunately in 2008 and 9 and to, to ride the slowest bike in moto gp against all of them is not an easy job but imagine, um, yeah. but whatever the results i pushed valentino around i passed him a few times i beat him in a couple of races and all the rest of it and I, I, I out-qualified him in my first race at Qatar, nearly on pole position, and um, and 
and I did my very, very best. Yeah. But um, yeah. on the package that I had, it was as good as it was going to get. I didn't know half the tracks. And again, I was talking about that earlier with the experience <clears throat> and inexperience of all that. When you've only got an hour and a half to learn a brand new circuit against those boys on the slowest bike, it's 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 an in it, it's a very 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 difficult job. But um, you know, regardless of what those two years were compared to 2007, um, I loved absolutely every every lap of it. And um, I, could, I you can't change things now. Of course, I would have loved to have been on a factory bike and and love to have seen what could have happened in those situations but if me auntie had wheels etc 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 um it's uh it was what it was i was i did myself proud um i, I didn't achieve what i would have liked to have done but uh in super bikes i didn't achieve what i want what i would have liked to have done and i think if you tick the way we do as competitors there isn't anything in life where you are satisfied <laughs> No, you're always no looking for what you've done. you know i know I, I can guarantee you valentino ross is not satisfied with nine you know yeah he's just probably annoyed he hasn't got double figures and think yeah things like that just because if you don't take that way you, you you're not going to be as successful as these people are you know and yeah um, yeah <clears throat> so you just gotta you just gotta the main thing is is just looking in the mirror knowing that you did absolutely everything you could to to do the best that you could in life and and you know I certainly did that. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a few things behind the scenes as well, which I want to get into as well with the change of crew chief and all that kind of thing. Um, just a comment, um, Oliver Taylor. Um, he said it was uh, one thing you did do was you outsold uh, Rossi uh, on the merchandise. Um, so he said, uh, yeah, he uh, equaled that Roberto GP Rossi clothing, and I'm sure in the Meadow Hall shop outsold Rossi. So <laughs> there you, you go. What? And I tell you, I tell you what, like, something you did do. Brand, you... Brands actually double, right? That, that's not even close to that achievement of outselling Rossi on merchandise. Right? That's to, mental. To, no. to outsell Rossi on merchandise, I'll tell you what, is probably my biggest achievement. Of I was going to say, that's almost at the top, isn't it? <laughs> it will be It will be forever. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, there's a, bit of merchandise, there's a bit of Rossi merchandise just like there, which was bought for me for Christmas last year. I mean, Meadow Hall, fair enough. But Donington Park, <laughs> that was my biggest achievement of the yeah. weekend. It Mega. wasn't beat to it wasn't it wasn't difficult to beat my result at Darlington Park, but to I was selling up merchandise was was uh, pretty was pretty good going. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Um, just keep going on the time. It's been two hours. I don't want to keep anyone up too late. Um, just very, I mean, you went back to um, went back to World Superbike. Um, was that something? You know, did you feel that like something that you felt like you wanted to do, or you had to do, or anything like that, or was it just um, that's what there was at the time and I, I had to. Uh, unfortunately for me, that year, just when I was kind of, because in MotoGP, as again, <laughs> I was talking about this previously. The first year was Michelin, so I had half the new tracks I didn't know, and then the second year was Bridgestone. So each year of my MotoGP career, I had tires I'd never ridden on, uh, right. and got experience on, and that was also a massive factor. Um, and while I'd got those two things, there was a Texan in world superbike that in his rookie season blitzed it and beat Haga on a factory Ducati. And he was an absolute sensation called Ben Spees. And oh, yeah. if, it, yeah, yeah. if it, if it wasn't for Ben Spees, I would have possibly had a much longer career in MotoGP. Right. But because of that, they had to find a position for him. And the one that was going was mine and the American market compared to mine and the potential of Ben at that point in time, was like a no-brainer for Yamaha, and I lost my position for that. And uh, but <laughs> how unlucky was it that that a rookie from America that no, didn't know the tracks won the World Superbike Championship in his first year on a Yamaha, which, which he hadn't done. I don't. He hadn't done ever. That was the first year ever Yamaha winning World Superbikes <laughs> ever. Yeah. Yeah, so, he mentioned it. Yeah, geez. Fair play to Ben Spees. Um, yeah. He deserved he deserved my ride, and obviously he went on to doing great things before his injury. And um, but again, it, that's you know sometimes how just timing works, doesn't it? I, I had a lot yeah. of times where timing went my way, and there was a few <clears> times where it doesn't. And I don't think any careers going to be any different to that. Yeah, it's just the uh, just the so, way things we basically, Sorry, yeah. So what your question was? I actually out. swapped. I swapped with Ben Spees. Basically, I went to World Superbikes on his Yamaha, and he went on to GP on, on my Yamaha. 
That's it. Now you say that, I remember it, yeah. But um, yeah, so you went with like Yamaha and then you had like the second year, like BMW and uh, oh, in that, <laughs> that second year. I mean, I, I've had those murmurings of, of going back to, you know, back to 10 count, but that never sort of came came about, did it? it was it anything that was ever going to happen? Or? Um, it, it may have just been the rumor mill flying around. I've no, no idea. But no, I, I don't. I don't think there was an opportunity to to go back to Tenkarte after after Yamaha. Uh, I can't remember why. Uh, I think I think because Jonathan Ray was just starting with him. I think, and he was you know he wasn't going to lose his job with what he was doing. No, sure. So. Um, so no, I, I don't think there was a, a position there okay. at that point in time. They'd already got a fast uh, British rider, uh, and I, I can, you know, looking back, I can see why they saw the potential in Jonathan. <laughs> and yeah, he's, he's he's yeah. He did all right. Yeah. Didn't he? he did all right. <laughs> he's, he's done a bit, doesn't he? He's done a bit. Um, but um, obviously you had the accident in Aragon, which damaged your wrist and everything. Was it? Um, was it? Difficult. I well, I've done some research. I, I can tell it was very difficult to call it a day, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, horrible. Yeah, worst day I of my bet. life. I mean, yeah, I saw something again in the last couple of weeks. It was you doing some laps around Silverstone, first time you'd got on a bike and given it a thrash for I don't know seven or eight years or something. And you said there was a line. You said you said you wanted to deal with some demons. Yeah. Um, was it, it? It was obviously getting back on the bike and sort of putting it to bed almost, but. It sounds like it was really, really difficult to do and to get through. Yeah, I, I had to go cold turkey on stopping motorcycle racing with my wrist injury. It, 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 it instantly left me with no movement in my wrist and awful pain. And in the last 11 years, I've had seven operations on it that have all failed uh, to result into it being now. I've had it fully fused eight months ago. And that's been really the journey that I've been battling with the wrist um, uh, from, from that day in Aragon. Uh, it was a horrible injury and uh, I've tried my best with every procedure going uh, under the sun to try and get some movement back and uh, but unfortunately they, they, they've all been unsuccessful unfortunately so um, the last result was always to fuse it which it is now um, it doesn't move at all the, the wrist is completely locked so uh, um, it, uh, it and but obviously with the wrist I, I can ride a motorcycle but um, I can't ride a motorcycle fully in race mode. Uh, yeah. And then Triumph contacted me when Triumph were going into Moto2 the, the next season to do a parade lap at Silverstone to promote that Triumph were coming to uh, to take over Honda's engine in the Moto2 category. And would I would I do that? And um, <clears throat> it was a big thing to to get my leathers on and, and cock my leg back over a bike again because um, when you go cold turkey on something that you love doing, whatever you're your, your, your uh, addiction is in life, um, you're better off staying away from it um, yeah. forever. And, uh, and I kind of have done. And, I, and I've, the only thing I ride a motorcycle for now is just once a year for the Sheffield Children's Easter egg run when we raise money for the hospital every year. It's a brilliant thing to do. Um, next year is the 20th year anniversary, actually, um, of, of doing that. God. 20 years I've been doing that for next year, in next Easter. So hopefully we'll have a big, uh, big event next year for that um and uh, uh but but i did that for triumph and to be honest i was the only rider that, that did a lap round silverstone that that weekend because it was when it absolutely hounded it down it in the race down, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah and they had it resurfaced remember and the resurfacing was all off so um so <laughs> so i was the only one to do the lap to be honest so i was quite proud of that but um nice. but yeah it it does it it, it's been awful to not mm. do what i love doing i think from listening to this you'll you'll i think anybody would understand that it wasn't just a, it wasn't just a job to me. It was an no. absolute passion and a, and, yeah. and, a, and a pleasure that actually it was it was me. It was who I was. So losing my identity as well as everything else through this injury, as is, is, um, I'm sure a lot of sportsmen that get injured that can't do it anymore uh, battle through. And it's quite I think it's quite um, well known and, and spoken about about mm. the battles of of, of ex sportsmen kind of coping with life beyond sport and. Um, it's uh, it, it it's 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 a it's a massive addiction to have this amount of exhilarating experiences in your life that motorcycle racing brings to you, and when you stand on a podium and listen to your national anthem, and you have brought a world championship back to your own country, um, 
uh, is is emotions that aren't natural and okay. and when your emotions are able to go on such a height through what you do compared to just normal day-to-day -day stuff um, the adaptation to that once you don't have that anymore is 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 a real 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 battle and it's a serious battle and um the one thing that i would give anybody advice and if they're if they're struggling with it is just to uh stay healthy um be good to yourself and um and try and stay focused on what the next thing is uh to uh, to get some satisfaction out of to giving yourself something to wake up for in the morning yeah like yeah can't imagine how tough that is um but um obviously you're still involved with it you're you know doing the commentary now i'm sure there was someone you know there's a few other bits as well somebody was asking earlier on uh, i think maggie day asked if you're still doing commentating next year james sorry matthew hughes has said you know fantastic com uh, fat fantastic commentator are you continuing next year is that the plan uh, I, I think so. I, I haven't had any phone calls from Eurosport yet. Um, extending the contract, it's only like a one-year roll. Uh, okay. But it, but it has gone really well this year with, with Greg. Yeah, I feel great. like we've got a great rapport going with it with each other, and a great kind of it's it's a bit of a tennis match, you know, commentary between the two commentators and what they they when you bounce off each other and 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 we 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 both feel very res we've got a, a massive responsibility on 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 being a part of that show and try to um, uh, give everybody an experience of commentary that, that is at the level of what the racing is. Unfortunately for me and Greg, the racing's never been better, really, ever. So it's not difficult to commentate excitedly uh, on it. And, and, and it's nice to hear that people are enjoying it because we, we do put a lot of effort in to try and make it as exciting as the racing actually is on, on, on screen. So fingers crossed it can carry on. Yeah, well, I totally hope so. It's you know, I think it's been, it's certainly been a great listen from you know from uh, you know from like, this side of the TV, as it were. Um, oh, thanks. So yeah, all very good. And from what I can see, everyone said the same thing. Um, you're also involved, don't you? Know, you've done some like mentoring work, guys like Danny Kent, and Danny Webb, things like that. Um, obviously, nice to give something back, isn't it, to these very talented guys? Yeah, it is. Dan, Dan, um, Danny Webb's doing a, a camp as well now for some for these kids, and that's yeah. going really well for him. Um, if you want to look at Danny Webb's camp um on his social medias and if you've got a young lad and, and they want to get into it i'd highly recommend his 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 camp that he's doing through the winter time and there's a, a, some amazing young talent coming through there and they are champions of the future some of those kids so i'm really excited to to see uh, how their careers develop and they're much younger they're like nine ten years old and they are yeah. fast so <laughs> It's going to be a while before we see them on the World we'll Series, but it's it's exciting. There's some exciting talent. I just hope that they get the the right opportunities that that we all need in life to yeah. work with the with the right people on the right bikes to um, to allow them to showcase what talents they have and what things cost it to work out for. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've just seen uh, Oliver Taylor again. Said I'd love to see uh, 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 James Whittam and JT James Taylor and uh, commentary pairing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but oh, the problem yeah. is with the problem is with James Whittam and Jay me is um, you haven't got Greg with all the stats uh, and, and all of the uh, uh, all of the data that you also need and all of the homework, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> you need someone that's done some homework <laughs> it's not the and, and, and doesn't just chat about what the riders are doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you need a bit of balance in there. <laughs> It'd be good fun though. Um, yeah. Uh, um, what we got here, Matt Flower. Um, it says says that Chloe Gleason is on it. Yes, I'm I'm aware of Chloe Gleason. She's very very good. She's very yeah, quick. Very um, also a young lady called uh, young lady called Peyton Richard. She's very very quick yeah. as well. Very yeah. very good. Um, yeah. We do a bit of backing for them, which is great. Um, very quickly on the world but um, Laura Kay on YouTube. Hello, Laura. Um, she said, uh, what do you think about Kawasaki and Ray's dominance in World Superbike for so many years in a row? Was it because Kawasaki's bike was way above the others or the level of Ray's rivals was insufficient? Ooh, good question. That's a good one. Full oh, crikey. <laughs> like nothing about nothing about Jonathan Ray being bloody good then. <laughs> uh, no, that would have been my go-to. Um... <laughs> um, that was a bit harsh, wasn't it? Bless him. Uh, now, Jonathan <laughs> Ray is the most successful superbike rider ever with six world championships and on the balance obviously as well um you cannot say he's better than foggy you cannot say he's better than doug pole and raymond rush mm. scott russell um 
uh, yeah, because yeah. different eras, different bikes, different competitors, yeah. uh, different times. But um, at that time, Jonathan Ray was the best. And to be that good that long and so many years, I know how much focus and dedication you, you need to put uh, with your life to, to be, to, to, to win champion, not win races, win championships is a completely different ball game on focus and commitment. And if, to win six on in a row uh, is quite incredible. And uh, Jonathan Ray on the Kawasaki with that Kawasaki team is everything that I got in 2007, in 2004. It's uh, and it, it doesn't come often. And when it does happen, it's uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Yeah, and it's, it's a fair play to him. Been fantastic to watch. And also say like last year we had like Top Rack as well. I mean, what that guy can do on a bike, my God. Um, yeah, he's... I mean Top Rack, and uh, you know, it, 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 on the flip side. There wasn't a top rack, and there wasn't a Bautista um, yeah. to, to in 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 the earlier days of of his six. And of course, he would have made his life much more difficult to win. But as you can see, he's he's right up there with them. He's still on he, it, yeah. He's still on it. So it's um, uh, but it, but it, it's so nice that uh, that Jonathan has got this level of competitors on these bikes now because yeah. it's made the racing so it, it's made the racing incredible. Yeah, and it's something that he's welcomed as well. He said it himself, you know, he's welcomed it. Yeah, um, yeah, because, you know, because winning six, you know, you need to stay motivated after you've won all that and you've earned that kind of money and life is very, very comfortable, right? It, to, to be competitive and to be motivated in life, um, it's not great to be comfortable. <laughs> no, I suppose not, no. no. It's not the thing you need in, in, in your life to, to keep yourself running. So Top Rack and, and Valchista coming along, just, it was like me getting sacked from Ducati and going to Honda. You, sometimes you need you need something to, to get you back on it again yeah just to shake it up a bit and yeah, yeah. um right very quickly when i get onto uh the band very quickly and tell you linden because um yeah i've listened to a lot of the stuff it's all very good um um pop it on a chain tune um <laughs> absolute tune that and renegades love it um and just uh yeah uh, i mean you've you've supported like quo and like deep purple and all these kinds of bands um pretty cool Pretty cool thing to be doing. Um, perhaps not as healthy, but still pretty uh, cool thing to do. Um, obviously, some some something you enjoy. I, 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 eight years of touring with Tozlin, but I mean, it, it was it, I, and it you know it's not it's not done yet. Um, mm. We haven't. We're still very very good friends, and and uh, will we go back in the studio again? Possibly. Um, I had a. Uh, I've had a really tough three or four years with the wrist because I tried a false wrist four years ago and it failed. And I didn't realize if that one did fail, I was then stuck and forced to have another three operations, which then took four years of my life without, I wasn't even able to brush my teeth for two years with it, with, wow. with when, when one particular operation went wrong. So it stopped my plane and I thought it was going to be an operation with a false wrist, a bit more movement, less pain. And I was going to be able to play even more comfortable. And I was going to be like four, three or four months out. And I was three or four years out basically wow. with, it, with that operation gone wrong. And, um, and like I say, I've, I've just had it fused eight months ago. I've, I've been adapting my playing again now with a fully fused wrist because it's not, it, 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 I've had to learn a different way a little bit with it, with it being locked, but I'm getting up to speed again. I'm getting, and. Danny Webb, my, my friend, he's just got married a couple of weeks ago and I learned and I, I wrote a song for his wedding and it got me playing again and I'm enjoying playing again. Uh, and my guitarist, uh, Ed, has just been up after not seeing him for two years. Uh, he's just been in today, literally today, uh, chatting about it uh, and who knows what what the future can, can, can hold. But those eight years touring with Deep Purple, like you say, Status Quo, Reef, um, Oh, really? uh, Aerosmith at, at calling was something. Wow, uh, it's um, um, it, it was it was fabulous to, 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 to kind of my first love of piano playing to walk out in front of all those thousands of people and perform, and create my grand's Christmas party, to all that again, like Brilliant. Grand's Arch, just just yeah, just incredibly incredibly fortunate to, to get an opportunity to do it, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And I, so I, I actually saw you guys at uh, Coco in London. Oh, wow, well, yeah, yeah. Coco yeah, Theatre, yeah. yeah, I was there on that one. And uh, yeah, it was great. That was one of the early ones. <laughs> no, it was, oh, it was yeah. cracking. Um, you know, cracking, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I basically went to see it. That was, it, with, that was yeah. with Reef, wasn't it? I think that we supported Reef that night. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, yeah, it was on yeah. some kind of anniversary, was it? Of yeah, yeah. Glow, was it Glow? Yeah, I, yeah think. I think it was. Yeah. Um, and when I saw you up on the bill, I was like, "Oh, get in!" I was like, Bonus. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, anyway, Coco's a cool club. Stream. Really cool club, isn't it, Coco? Yeah, it's very cool. I've been a few gigs there. It's very, very yeah. cool. Um, uh, yeah, we spoke about Rick Parfit and Junior earlier on and all that kind of thing. Um, you two guys have had like the life that I wanted when I was five, <laughs> racing and front man in a band. I'm like, I know. I, I, to I'm be honest, you know, talking I, about I, it now, I, so it's fine. Yeah, people can hold a pretty bad, pretty bad big grudge on on on, on what I've been able to do in life. It's uh, I'm, I'm quite to, uh, it's quite humbling to. Uh, I I kind of I kind of tone it down a bit when I'm when I'm telling the story because. Uh, it can get people's back up a bit with with jealousy yeah, sometimes. That's their, <laughs> that's their problem. Get on it, yeah. No, it's no, it's great to be talented at many things. Excellent. Um, right, just want to through some very very fun quick questions right at the end. Um, before we let everyone go because it's we've taken up a lot of your time. Um, no and thank you everyone for tuning in uh, again as always. Um, firstly, just you know, um, Brad Ray going to. Um, world, so he's sort of talking about it, but I think him and Shaky have got to find a few quid, haven't they? Um, I think he'd be good. I think he, he it'd be a good thing for him to do, wouldn't it? Anybody that wins a British Superbike Championship has got the riding ability to be competitive at World Superbikes. It just depends what opportunity do they get there, because yeah. against Bautista, Jonathan Ray, and Top Rack on tracks that you don't really know on a non-competitive bike is like me going to MotoGP on a Tech Trois. It doesn't matter what talent you've got, what confidence you've got, uh, you're going to get a spanking. And yeah. um, he's got to be really, really careful. And it's, yeah. it's just a shame that over the past kind of, well, five or six years or whatever it is, that the British Superbike champion doesn't get the, uh, the, the, the kind of kudos to automatically get promoted to World Superbikes like they used to. Yeah. and get paid to do it. Um, uh, it's a real crying shame that the British Superbike champion now has to find £200,000 to even go and try and get a ride. Uh, there's yeah. something wrong. There's just something wrong there. And yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's, it's just not right because Bradley Ray's talents um, are equally up there with your Rinaldi's and Lowe's and, and, and Locatelli's. Yeah. Um, he has been unreal. About what he's doing. Um, obviously trying to beat Lowe's in World Superbikes on a factory Kawasaki with Lowe's experience and talent, Bradley Ray probably wouldn't wouldn't surpass that, right? Yeah. But Bradley's got the riding ability. If he if he had a, a year or two uh, of, of development, um, he has the potential to ride that good. Yeah. Is he, is, is, he, is he good enough to get to the level of Jonathan Ray Bautista and Top Rack? Well, that's down to the level of team and bike that he rides but also yeah. how much commitment bradley wants to put into it and obviously you know is is is, is putting everything into it at the minute being mm. british of white champion but i just i just think it's wrong that he has to find money to go there it's uh, some yeah it's a shame yeah and that's uh, that seems to be a thing across all kinds of motorsport whether it be bikes or cars or anything it's just you know to get you know i mean money's always talked and it always will um but it's even more so now isn't it it's just you know if it, it's all about the wallet rather than rather than the talent well, it just maybe. drops off very dramatically from the top the pyramid is very very uh, 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 sharp now on on, mm. on the on the scale from mm. from six downwards um you know you're <clears> not only not earning very much at all but you're having to bring money into it and yeah um, there's only those top six but but the top three are doing very very well um uncomfortably well compared to let's say rinaldi you know yeah rinaldi to keep that job for next year uh, i mean <laughs> i mean tough. i've just told you my story in the factory ducati team right um he 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 will never ever beat bautista mm. on a factory ducati until Bautista gets to being 55 years old or yeah. he has an injury, right? That's completely clear, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, Ronaldo is just in a bit of a kind of like transitional period of when they find somebody else to, to replace Bautista or find somebody better than Ronaldo. Finding someone sense. better than Ronaldo is not easy. He's a very, very talented rider. But 
he's not showing the potential of being able to beat Jonathan and top rack and Bautista. So already he hasn't got a deal for Ducati. Yeah, right. That's as brutal as it is. Um, he's sort of shooting incredibly high, isn't he? he? No matter how good he is. Well, he has to. He has he's to. Shooting yeah. He has yeah. to. He has to keep the belief and that that in to keep the belief against Bautista. It's like keeping the. It's like Zwan Mir keeping the belief in the Repsol Honda team now against Marcus. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter that he was a 2020 world champion. Yeah. Like, if he's the bridesmaid forevermore, like he's just done to Paul Espargaro. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's it. I tell it's you tough. what, it's unbelievably difficult to be a teammate of someone so special yeah. that is able to have the talents to push that bike, that package completely to its limits. Yeah. Right. And if that rider's doing that, how do you do more than that? Yeah. How you you can't. How do you, you do more you, than you that? You can't get better than what they're doing. Yeah. No, you can't because the skill level and the talent of that rider is the limit. So. All you can hope for is get to that and try and hang on. Yeah. And then if you do get a little bit of of, of, of a smidgen of a door that opens, and then it's just about getting the confidence and the hierarchy of when you walk into the garage that you've got you've got it, you've got that kid now. Yeah. But to yeah. get that over the Bautistas and the Jonathan Rays and the top racks and the Marqueses of this world, oh, I'll tell you what, yeah. it's a tough old gig. <laughs> Gotta be going some, yeah. Um, again, Oliver Taylor, our Yorkshireman, he said, oh, we need more Yorkshire folk in the top brass. He won't pay over the odds for anything and won't charge more than spare. <laughs> Team, how much? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I like what I say. That's what I like. <laughs> start it up. Start it up. Um, Britain, any desire to do the Arleman TT? Was there any sort of thought, you know, wish to, oh, yeah. No, that. that that was one thing I made a pact with my mom because with the personal situation when I first started racing yeah. and my mom didn't want me to do it, I said, oh, "Look, mom, I'll just stick to the tracks. I promise, and uh, and I'll not I'll not do the road." And luckily, just after the period when I started road racing, in the when it was at its heights, where foggy and hizzy and everybody were, were doing the TT and winning and stuff, um, just after that in the early two thousands, you didn't really have to do it to make a name for yourself like you used to in the past. Yeah. So it, it, there was no kind of like external pressures to ask me to do it as well. So um, luckily, when I started in my career, it wasn't ne uh, necessary, uh, fortunately for me personally. Not that's not taking anything away from all of those brave people that do it. That's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Uh, I just, uh, I'd, I'd be nervous just going to watch the thing. Um, <clears throat> okay, very quick. Um, best bike you've ever raced. <clears throat> Honda Tenkati. Not surprised with that one. Um, Favourite circuit, UK and globally? Franz at Phillip Island. Oh, yeah. Man after my own heart. Get in. Uh -huh. um, okay, this is the tough one. The last question. You've ridden against a lot of amazing riders, as we've touched on. You know, you know, you know you're know, you racing against like, um, you know, like Haslam and Christopher Merlin and Hodgson and Melandri, Caparossi, Gibbonau and Pedroza, Davizioso, Lorenzo, Stoner, Slight, Hayden, Bayliss, Edwards, Corsa, Keeley, Hagen, Ray, Rossi, all uh, amazing racers. Is there one that stands out in your mind as being just like the benchmark almost for a rider? Whew. Tough question, I know. <laughs> I, I followed Valentino for all of the racing Qatar. I followed him for most of the race in Australia, and and I could I could see I could see why he was a nine-time world champion. The precision of him, um, that and that's the that's the thing with Valentino: the precision and the experience that he had on on these tracks, and how little few mistakes he made was just unbelievable, and. Um, so I was very fortunate to get like a, a literally um, a bird's eye view of, of of that following him on his back wheel until the checkered flag every single lap. But Casey Stoner, um, I there's only, I never rode, rode 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 against Marquez, but there's only a, there's only really Stoner and Marquez that did things on a motorcycle I can literally 100% hands up say I couldn't do on a bike. <laughs> wow. And so wow. 
it, it, it's it, it's those two guys that um um really 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 um upsettingly uh, <laughs> um i had to uh, i had to admit defeat <laughs> annoyingly <laughs> good I, t I tell you what <laughs> that ain't easy for <laughs> for oh. some for a competitor to, uh, yeah. to to even say those words never mind uh, never mind 100 admit that but yes incredible um mark marquez i've never ridden against so stoner and rossi and all pedroza and lorenzo lorenzo on his day my god <laughs> unbelievable um but um mark marquez i watch him and some of those saves he does on these on his elbow and stuff like that oh, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I never i never did that i never could do that on, on a motorcycle i never could do those things on a motorcycle um i could rattle around at a fair old pace but it's um uh it, it's it's stunning what that kid has done to motorcycle racing yeah unreal unreal yeah. right <clears throat> well two and a half hours i mean it's whizzed by but um firstly thank you to everyone who's tuned in and for the comments and the questions we hopefully we've uh, covered everything uh, all those comments and questions that you put in very much appreciate everyone tuning in and of course biggest thanks uh, to you uh, james it's been brilliant talking to you something i've wanted to do for a very long time so thank you very much uh, for coming in and having a chat about all kinds of things uh, it's, my pleasure it's brilliant. my pleasure like chasing the racing you know bless him chris in that it's uh, uh it, it it's it's it, it's really i think it's really important for young riders especially listening to stuff i've, I've experienced lads like myself and for people that are getting into it people that aren't into it that that are into it now because they know the backstory about how this industry works and um I've, these podcasts that have come along for the last like you know five ten years it's uh, I've listened to a few myself on just different subjects and it's it's um, it, it, it's fascinating and I think it's really important that people get an insight from from the people within to um, to, to give their experiences it's, it's been great yeah and I, I definitely agree um, you know no, no matter what the subject it's nice to you know to be able to you know to hear insights and backstories and what goes on behind the scenes which you don't normally yeah. hear so um, it is. if anyone tuning in gets that from this then that's brilliant um, but thank you very much to everyone. And of course, thank you very much uh, to you, James. Um, we'll be back with uh, some more chats coming up. But uh, no, brilliant speaking to you. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very, very much. Really appreciate Pleasure. it. Pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Nice one.